Okay, my dear Mai, um, Karja, um, welcome to our seventh meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, and just to remind members that the F4 button on your tablet turns the sound off, so <laughs> if we can all turn our sound off. Of members or the tablet? <laughs> <laughs> um, the and the, me the meeting is now open to the public. Um, members are reminded that they should declare any interest relevant to today's proceedings. Um, the mobile devices can be used by both members and those in the public gallery as long as they're in airplane mode and devices are muted and it's not permitted to take photographs or to record any of the meeting. Um, the meeting will be recorded on video and broadcast live and the video of the meeting will be available on the Assembly website afterwards. Chair? Um, yes, sure. Can I have it recorded in the records that I'm a former member of the Senate of Queen's University? Thanks. Thanks, Gazer. I'm currently studying, studying with the Open University. Thanks. Um, so today the committee will hear from Open University and Queen's University. The Open University will be given an overview including highlights or sorry, priorities and challenges for the university and Queen's University will be presenting an overview and wishes to use the briefing as an interactive session that will allow it to shape its response to the committee's letter requesting its priorities. Um, and also to remind members that a lunch will take place after this meeting in uh, the private members' dining room um, at 12.45 with Queen's University and include D Dr. Katie Hayward and Professor David Finnemore. Um, so moving on then to item one, apologies. Um, have we any no, one? So we just have apologies from Stuart. Um, item number two then is the draft minutes from last week, which are on page five of your pack. Um, are members content that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, then moving on to item number three, which is chairperson's business. There is um, correspondence in your pack at page 11 from the Finance and Constitution Committee of the Scottish Parliament regarding a half-day conference that it will hold as part of its inquiry into the UK internal market on the 24th of April. And the committee is keen that views from across the UK are heard as part of the conference, and they have invited the Economy Committee Chair and Clerk. So uh, I am intending to attend okay, that. Well, we, will, we will sort that out. <coughs> okay, so then point um, 3.2 at page 13 of your packs is correspondence from the NI Tourism Alli um, Alliance, um, basically highlighting concerns around the, the points-based immigration system and seeking a meeting with, with myself. So if members are content, the, the, myself and, and Sinead as Deputy Chair will arrange to meet with, with them, and members will be informed of the date and time so they can attend if they wish. Yeah. Great. OK, so moving on then to item number four, and I'd like to, to welcome the Open University to today's meeting. Um, and you will find a briefing on page 21 of your pack. The briefing outlines a number of successes that the university has had, including in terms of widening access and participation, operating a unique model of nurse education, high levels of student satisfaction, innovating in the field of employability, knowledge transfer partnerships, and the open learn pro program and a range of collaborations that the university has in place. <coughs> The briefing also indicates the university is prioritising supporting the delivery of the PFG, continuing to widen access to those who would not traditionally have considered higher education, encouraging lifelong learning and partnerships with FE and other HE providers. The briefing also highlights the financial challenges that the university and wider sector faces, with the university increasing enrolments while core funding is static. The university also believes that the commitments in the New Decade New Approach document can only be delivered through cross-sectoral and cross-departmental working. So I'd like to welcome um, John Darcy and, and Michael Bauer um, to, to our meeting this morning. Um, and I'd like to invite you to make a, a statement. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, members, for the invitation to meet the committee this morning. Um, <clears throat> as you've said, uh, Chair, the, the briefing highlights a number of the, the issues and successes and priorities that we have as a university uh, serving every, every constituency in every county of Northern Ireland. Um, we have a significant birthday last year. It was our 50th anniversary, having been set up in 1969 by the Harold Wilson government and um, I think the, the sort of success we've had here in Northern Ireland in terms of widening access is testimony to the vision of the Labour government at that time. I suppose our core work is in terms of widening access and widening participation 
and the interesting way that we deliver that is directly to people in their homes or their workplaces. Um, so we don't necessarily need to worry about, about buildings. We maximise our use of technology. Um, there are probably some people here my sort of vintage who would probably remember the late night BBC2 television programmes, um, which I suppose was really the first um, bit of uh, educational technology that we pioneered. Uh, in 2020, things are very different, so we, we use the internet significantly, we, use, uh, our, we assist our students accessing uh, their course materials through smart devices, tablets and, and whatever else, and we're, we're making great strides in making sure that our technology keeps pace with what students have in their homes, and that's worked very well for us. Um, I think, I suppose the one thing um, that we would point out is that over the last decade in particular, we've seen very strong student growth in terms of our full-time equivalent numbers. And you can see in that very small graph in our briefing that over the last three or so years that has um, uh, uh, escalated considerably. And one of the things that, that we put that down to was the introduction by the Assembly of part-time uh, top-up loans for students. Um, and that has had a really good impact in keeping that accessibility going, Chair, for students right across Northern Ireland. Um, in paragraph five, we do the breakdown over the last couple of years across each constituency. And I'm pleased to say that across most constituencies, we're seeing an upturn. So the numbers will go up and down each year, but there's a consistency there which we think is really encouraging. Um, part of our success, sir, is working with organisations like um, Libraries Northern Ireland. So we have always um, had sort of open days in libraries, and uh, we've just uh, agreed a, a new memorandum of understanding with Libraries Northern Ireland, which will give us access to all 96 libraries across Northern Ireland so that our students can make use of, for example, the super-fast broadband that you would see in a library, but also the very comfortable um, and well-appointed uh, library space that Libraries Northern Ireland have put forward. So we would expect and we hope that those numbers will continue to grow. And also we think that's been um, assisted by our growing partnerships with the FE sector. So over the last 18 months or so, we have signed significant partnerships for validation and for articulation with Belfast Metropolitan College, Southern Regional College and South West College. Um, and as a university, we're, we're delighted at the quality that those three colleges are, are bringing to our sort of portfolio. It's been noticeable at the committees which approve those partnerships that they are very complimentary about the quality of submissions from Northern Ireland colleges. And we expect the other three colleges to begin uh, work with us over the next uh, period of time as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, chair widening participation is, is certainly in our DNA. And in paragraph six, we refer to the number of students that would be studying with us who are living in quintile one of the Northern Ireland multiple deprivation measure. So around about 25% of our students are coming from the most disadvantaged parts of Northern Ireland, and they are succeeding. And one of the great sort of informal bits of feedback we get from parents, because the average age of a Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland OU student is about 31 years of age, is that through their studies, they're, begin, they're, they're getting more confident at encouraging their children to study and to succeed in, in schools. So that's a, an interesting byproduct of, of adult learning. Um, one of the key vocational successes we've had um, over the last 10 years is our work with the Department of Health in the provision of a part-time nursing program. Um, and that operates across all of the trusts. Um, and we, we work with Unison and the RCN to encourage healthcare assistants to consider uh, upskilling significantly to become fully qualified nurses. Our numbers in that chair have grown from around about 10, 15 students 10 years ago to 150 plus this year. And the great thing is that when those students qualify as nurses, they stay in their localities. Um, so there's very little um, loss of, of the talent that we've helped to create. Um, one thing we're very proud of is our student satisfaction ratings, and for a, a university that is uh, distant to most of its learners, usually the only time we stu see students is when they um, sign up, come to tutorials, or when they graduate. Um, so the fact that we have been number one for student satisfaction over a, a long period of time, I think says something about the quality of teaching that we have in the university through our part-time lecturers and our core staff but also the fantastic staff that we have who man our telephone lines, our web <coughs> chats, uh, and that's a team that Michael leads. So the, the support they get from thinking about doing a course to completing a course, and of course when you're doing it part-time and you've got a family and all the other pressures, um, keeping that motivation is really important and it's one of the great things that our, that, that our staff uh, in, in Belfast take forward with them all. 
Employability, like for every university and college, is very important for us. And over the last number of years, we've made significant successes in bringing um, our part-time students to major employers. And we do that through visits to facilities like Allstate, the Law Society for Northern Ireland, Randox. So major players that our students hopefully can, can aspire to get jobs in. And we've also pioneered virtual internships. Um, where people can be an intern but not be physically in the office space. And I think um, in terms of getting people into sectors that, that it's difficult to get into, that, that's an interesting concept for us to take forward and we're, we're happy to share that with the, the committee at any time. Knowledge transfer is important for any university and um, we, we're proud now to be a member of the Matrix panel and also a full, full player within Connected. One thing to share as well as our formal education, we, we do a lot of informal. Uh, so we still do the big production um, uh, uh, programmes with BBC, like Blue Planet and most recently Hospital, which I think was really popular. But we also have a site called Open Learn, and it's free for anyone to use. And the figures, as you can see in paragraph 11, are significant. Um, in the last year for which we have stats 65,500 citizens uh, from Northern Ireland, that was a unique browser for us to Open Learn. And some of the courses are a really good preparation for study, not just with ourselves, uh, but indeed for any other university or any other college. Um, one of the other things that I think is driving our success with widening participation is our links with groups like Falls Women's Centre, Ballybean Women's Centre, Shankill and Kulkuli. And again, we try to work in a partnership approach with um, significant players within communities because they can be an aggregator for us in, in attracting students. I think for people that have never been to university or maybe first in family, there is a little bit of a chill factor, can I do it? And I think working with groups like that and others, um, we, we help build people's confidence to actually begin some higher level study with ourselves. Um, we're also um, very proud of a piece of work we've done over the last year or so with um, Enterprise Ireland and uh, Invest Northern Ireland, and this is an Open for Growth programme, uh, which is online distance learning to help companies develop a, a business plan, a growth plan, to move them on to the next level. Uh, so we've just finished a full um, economic review of that, and we hope to go live of that in the autumn of 2020. Not just here in Northern Ireland, but as, uh, Scotland is very keen to pick up as well. So it's good to see innovation that we're driving here um, being exported to, to other locations. Um, key priorities for us are to obviously assist citizens have better lives. Um, our mission is to be open to people, places and methods and ideas and we think we can add value to the work of the Assembly through the programme for government, particularly in terms of sustainable economic growth and, and wellbeing. Um, we are committed to obviously championing lifelong learning. Um, so that we, we fundamentally believe that higher education should be an option for people that, not, that are not necessarily 18 years of age, that may want to do it at a pace that suits themselves, that may not want to go to a brick university. Um, and I think, you can, as you can see from our numbers, that is certainly um, resonating with many citizens across, across Northern Ireland. I think a key thing for us also is the power of part-time higher education to address skills gaps. Um, we offer a modular uh, approach to study so people can dip in and out um, of different subject areas and piece together what we call an open degree, which can include bits of science, bits of business, bits of arts, social sciences, whatever suits a person and also can contribute to the business. In terms of our challenges, you'll not be surprised, like our peer universities, uh, funding is a challenge and particularly as we have seen growth. Um, we, we are not capping our courses at the minute because we think they are um, providing a valuable way for people to gain skills um, for themselves, for their organisations, for their families and for the whole region. Um, and we do see lots of opportunities within New Decade, New Approach. Um, one thing we are excited by, obviously, is the announcement recently of the additional nursing places. And we feel the success of our model will be, will, will, will be playing a major role in that as well. So, Chair, that's a, a very quick run through at the paper. Um, Michael and I are very happy to have a conversation or take any questions <coughs> that members may have. Thank you, John. Um, I, I think I probably reflect all members in SEM. Um, we recognise the, the key role that part-time education plays, and it's really important to, to our economy and to the wider society. I think it's something we're probably going to see more of as the you know as the economy develops and people are moving into new jobs and new jobs are actually being created in terms of the actual roles um, and the types of uh, jobs into the future. Um, there's an awful lot there that you have covered. I, I just wanted to pick up on a, a couple of things specifically. Um, 
In relation to the, the nursing programme, the, the career progression pro programme, um, the, who pays for that? Is that funded by the, the individuals themselves? Well, that's funded by the Department for Health. Um, so annually, we would have a commissioning meeting with the chief, well, with the Department of Health, but it's also heavily supported by the chief nursing officer. Um, so I think all nursing programmes in Northern Ireland would be funded by the Department of Health, and I think that that's a good working example of how universities like ourselves can work on a cross-departmental basis. Okay. Um, the partnerships <coughs> with the the community sector, um, obviously key in terms of um, you know opening up participation and access opportunities. Um, what exactly, do, how do those work? I, I, um, you know, is it like taster sessions or um, is it just a, a awareness raising? Um, I'm going to be hand over to Michael to answer that. Well, so um, for three of the women's centres, it's based around our access programme. Uh, so they would, so our access uh, programme would last about nine months or so. Um, so it provides additional face-to-face -face tutorial support for those students, so mostly access students. If you're a typical access student enrolling online, it would be mostly at a distance with telephone and, and email support. Um, however, for those groups, um, we've been providing extra face-to-face -face tutorial support and trying to bring a cohort and a community um, based in those local communities together, um, which works really, really well. Um, and it's a programme we're developing. Um, we're looking to <coughs> explore how we can scale that up across Northern Ireland on a sustainable basis as well. Um, so, be quite interested to speak to to the minister in the future about that. Um, uh, in Kilcooley Women's Centre, we're actually um, supporting it around uh, one of our um, uh, health and social care modules, um, which is the same module that a lot of the trust staff would complete. Uh, and is a, is a highly valued um, module um, by the trust. So it's you know there there's, there could be hopefully direct employment outcomes for those students um, studying at um, NQF level four um, qualifications at that point. So that's interesting. So that's the first year we've worked with with them on that model. So yeah, we're we're excited to see how mm -hmm. we can <coughs> engage more with the community sector and. Uh, encourage greater participation through through those routes. I think that's really positive. Um, you see, in terms of the the partnerships with the regional colleges, are, is that just can, can you just elaborate on that a wee bit for me? Is it in terms of degree awarding powers for their courses, and is it only their part time courses, or how, how exactly is that? Working. But basically, we, we would validate their provision, so particularly at foundation degree level. So with Belfast Met in particular, uh, we've been working on cyber security. Um, that's been a huge area for them with a lot of employer employer engagement. And the numbers that they're putting through, Chair, are very, very significant. Um, Michael, do you want to give a flavour of what the other colleges are doing with this subject matter? Absolutely. Um, so it's mostly in the areas of STEM and the most economically relevant um, subject areas. So Belfast Met is um, computing, cloud and application development, um, Southern Regional College is around digital marketing and digital construction, um, and Southern, uh, or sorry, South West is um, uh, around engineering and I can't remember other STEM related areas. <laughs> Mine just went blank, sorry. Um, but those have been very successful in terms of um, well, the cyber security program in, in Belfast Met uh, running two years now. Um, and they form part of the, the higher level apprenticeship there. Um, and the uh, apprentice of the year uh, in the awards uh, uh, last month that, that was announced, um, the, the student came from that program. Uh, and what we've been doing in those programs is building in articulation routes for any of those uh, students. On those programs, we want to progress through to complete a full degree. They can articulate straight into the Open University as well. Um, so it's very much a collaboration and a partnership. And we see working with FE. That there's there's certain students who FE can reach that we won't be able to reach that other institutions won't be able to reach, and um, so really it is about widening access, supporting the economy, uh, increasing opportunity. We have huge skills deficits within our economy, and if we can support and enable um, our colleagues in FE to to reach more of those students and 
appropriate uh, you know, support the creation of jobs in, in key areas regionally across um, Northern Ireland, then we're, we're really keen to do so. It would be a, a key priority for us going forward to, to work collaboratively with our colleagues in FE. Yeah. And then just but finally for myself, I, th I think that the Open for Growth um, is a really exciting prospect and giving people the opportunity to, to kind of access that level of support <coughs> online. Is it, you know, um, so has there been a, a cohort that's already done that and that's now being evaluated to, to roll out further? Yeah, we, we've worked with around 15 companies on both sides of the border and they've tended to be companies that are in far-flung places. So one of the most interesting ones is a, a chemical testing company in West Cork. And the big advantage for them is they don't have to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and the other innovative thing, Chair, about the programme is it's not like an MBA where the managing director does an MBA. It's like a group licence. So mm -hmm. for the course fee, four or five members of staff can be involved. So that means you can have your senior management team, marketing, finance, mm -hmm. technology, whatever. Um, so they're actually doing their, their exercises together um, in, at the workplace and we have one or two face-to-face -face, uh, uh, encounters where they can begin to network with each other. But the prime delivery method is with associate lecturer support um, by email, by telephone, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and I think both Enterprise Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland have, have seen advantages in it. It's very different to anything they currently do. That's probably one of the challenges to it, but certainly the feedback we've had from our colleagues in the Open University in Scotland and the Open University in Wales is very encouraging because they have the same issues of peripherality that we have. Um, uh, so we, 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 we do think that um, it'll, it'll be mainstreamed hopefully autumn 2020. The evaluation results have been very, very positive. And I suppose the other interesting thing was this hasn't cost uh, any government anything, or it hasn't cost the university anything. We were fortunate to get a, a <coughs> from two business people who wanted to recognise the value of the university here in Ireland, um, and they, they very much gave us a blank sheet of paper to work on. So it's been a very innovative piece of work. Michael has led on it um, with the Faculty of Business and Law. Is yeah. there anything I've forgotten about, Michael? No, no, John, so it's very comprehensive. Um, the, I suppose the, what we develop the programme in mind of is not your Let's say your high growth potential startup. Um, you know, startups are experiencing extremely high growth year on year. It's more aimed at the, the kind of small business who has potentially plateaued in their growth, um, potentially become a bit static, whether that's maybe they were you know, three or four years in existence and they, they don't necessarily have the, the management capacity or, or the experience of, of business strategy to really identify their, their growth trajectory. Um, or it could be a, a second or third country family business who um, uh, feels the need to diversify uh, and find new markets. And this is really to, to improve their, their management um, capability, but really focused in around how they navigate business growth. And so that growth action plan, which is the main output of the programme, um, is, has, was really, really valuable for the participants who completed the, the pilot programme. Um, and actually all of them have been using that in many different ways, whether that's to leverage more support from Enterprise Ireland and Invest NI in, in the case of this, um, or whether that's to take to an investor um, or a bank in terms of access to finance. Um, so, so it's, yeah, no, it's been a, been a very interesting and an innovative programme, reaching a group of businesses who are, who are traditionally very challenging to, to get them very time poor, can't yeah. attend, uh, lots of face-to-face -face sessions within the, you know, the various cities potentially. So, um, so yeah, no, we're, we're quite excited about taking it to the next next level. No, that, that's a, a really interesting model. I'm sure we'll want to hear more about it. In, in yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Can, can certainly do so. Right. Yeah. Thank you, um, John. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, John, Michael, thank you so much for the questions and for the presentation so far. Um, just to commend you, first of all, on um, Open University generally. I think I've got a number of friends who've done courses or are doing courses with it, and it is a brand that's recognised by, I think, the overwhelming majority of people as a credible brand and one that's gone above and beyond. And you know, that's reflected in your numbers here in Northern Ireland. I mean, up in virtually all constituency, 15 out of 18, mm -hmm. so I commend you on that. Um, the nursing stuff, I know the Chair touched on it slightly, or, um, is exciting. I mean, in the last 10 years, you've gone from 15 to 150 nursing places. Is that capped out currently at a capacity level or a financial level? Is there respect to grow that even further, given the pressures we have in nursing, 
because I mean these are people who are currently in the health profession. We don't take them out of Northern Ireland, as you mentioned. So yeah. like, it will be a game changer to fill some of those spots. Yeah, no, there's certainly opportunity to grow the provision. We've recently increased our capacity in Northern Ireland with additional staff tutors. Okay. Um, and also our administration team. But the great thing about our programme is it's we, we have UK backup as well in terms of the admin. So in terms of us growing quickly, that's very, very possible. Um, I, I think it's just down to budget within the Department of Health. Um, and certainly the new decade, uh, new, new, new approach, uh, does give that additional capacity of mm -hmm. 300 new nurses per year. So we would hope that a proportion of them would be going the Open University route. Um, it's great to have the, the support of the chief nurse. Um, I think she sees a particular power in it. And you're working with already very engaged, very high quality staff within the health service. Mm -hmm. And what this program does is allows them to build their knowledge, their understanding, their capability. But they actually bring it back to the ward in real time exactly. because they're not being taken away from the ward for long periods of time. Um, the, the, the completion rate's very high, the retention rate's very, very high, and also the success of the programme is commendable. We, we had one of our students was the Student Nurse of the Year a few years ago, and you know he has gone on to great things with the Royal College of Nursing. He's now leading a campaign to get more men into nursing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're, you're right, John. It does touch um, a potential resource pool mm -hmm. that, that maybe wouldn't have thought of becoming a, a, a nurse. And the more students we graduate, I think the more powerful it is <coughs> that peer encouragement. Mm -hmm. So we, we would be confident that if we were asked to to, to, to put, bring more nurses onto our program, we could do that. I don't see the statistics on it, but my gut instinct is to those who go through that programme because they're already in frontline stay in Northern Ireland. Yeah, absolutely. So you're not losing yeah. them to other places in the UK, yeah. for example. Yeah. The both of them actually still stay within the, the area that they started in. Okay. They will do placements in different the hospitals, shop. but mm -hmm. I think the great thing is you're upstairs within a community. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the, the wider aspects of programme for growth and making life better for citizens across Northern Ireland, yeah. that's a very strong model. <laughs> I have one more chair just briefly. Um, obviously, you've built up a reputation for having flexibility being the key to you know, open university courses that people can do it in their own time at their leisure over a, a longer period of time but for those who might want to get involved or haven't been able to complete what are you seeing as those consistent um, factors that are proven to be barriers for open university students who maybe aren't completing or aren't taking the course are there ones that you're seeing continually and what can we or you do to overcome those? Um, I'm, I'm maybe like Michael pick that up but I think at, at a general level it tends to be life getting and <coughs> study okay. um, so if, 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 all. even <laughs> in the nursing program I would say each year we would have a number of, of, of female nurses would take a break because of pregnancy. Yes. So it's those life changing things uh, that impact people but I think the great thing is you can take a break for a year or two and then come back mm -hmm. and top up and also change your direction quite a bit as well because we, if you start with us you don't have to do a, a BA in psychology or a Bachelor of Science in psychology. It can be an open degree which means you can pick modules from the whole range across all the faculties. And it's interesting talking to some entrepreneurs because uh, we do, do have links with Enterprise Northern Ireland as well um, and they see that sort of mix and match approach to getting a degree together is very helpful for small and growing businesses because you can get that little bit of marketing, a bit of, bit of law for that matter, and then technical stuff through, say, cyber security or software development. But Michael, would there be anything coming through students yeah, important? Well, uh, you know, first of all, it's important to note that um, the Open University within Northern Ireland has the highest retention rates of all the, 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 well. the, 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 the um, four, four nations. I mean, you've got the UK, which is good, uh, good, good to note. But um, yeah, I think, as John said, lots of things get in the way. Certainly, we, we are finding mental health issues being very, very prominent coming through from our students. And, and we're trying to put more and more uh, emphasis on, on supporting those students, but that, that would be, be quite prevalent. With, with being um, open access and one of our, um, I suppose, founding principles uh, as, as, as part of the Open University was that we are open access, so we don't, um, uh, we, we don't put pre-entry qualifications to the vast majority of our courses, and that's mm -hmm. been a, a founding uh, you know, a principle which has thrived through the OU for the last 50 years. Um, so, we do try to give the best advice and guidance at the earliest point to ensure that people are making the right decisions for them. So I've mentioned about access, we try to encourage people to <coughs> access module to build up their confidence. Um, but sometimes we do have people who are on our courses and um, you know, potentially they're, they're maybe not just at the level for, for HE. And, and one of the things that um, I'm wanting to explore with our FE colleagues is to have a more fluid relationship whereby if we have some of our students, because Johnny said about how you know, what, what can we do about it? Um, 
some of our students, um, if they just aren't coping with either the distance learning side of things or um, perhaps they would benefit from you know, doing doing study at a um, you know level level two level three um, kind of level, and um, that we would could proactively facilitate a conversation with their local FE college to try and keep them in the education system. Um, and, and I think because that's something I'm, I'm very keen, I, I don't want people to have made the choice to invest in, in their education uh, and their development and you know, for the various reasons that we outlined, potentially not not get there, but there could be other routes for them. So um, that, that's something I really want to explore with, with FE through those collaborations which are emerging over the coming um, coming months. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, John and Michael. Um, I suppose one of the um, benefits for Open University I see is access to education, for, um, to, to higher education, particularly for rural areas. Do you, do you have a breakdown of where people are studying from across Northern Ireland? Because I think, you know, I appreciate you maybe not have that with you today, but it might be interesting to see if that is a route for people, particularly in rural areas, who do find it more difficult to access the two main institutions. Yeah, well, we certainly have everybody broken at like constituency level. Mm -hmm. I think we probably can go deeper than that as well, Claire, mm -hmm. and yeah. be very happy to do that sort of sort of breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right. It, it, there is um, there is a sense with um, part-time education. Uh, I think people want to minimise the amount of time they're stuck in a car mm -hmm. or stuck in a mm -hmm. train. Uh, so it even has mm -hmm. sustainability and, and green issues as well. And, and our new vice chancellor <coughs> is very keen that we. As, as, as UK and as Europe and as Ireland, look at how people can study smarter. Um, so I, th I think the fact that people can study in their own homes and their own businesses is a real strength. But mm -hmm. we'd be very happy to dig a little bit deeper yeah. into those stats for you. Yeah. Sure. On, a, sorry, Chair, um, on, a, on a contrary kind of position, do you see any challenges to what you're offering coming from either the two main institutions or indeed other maybe private sector organisations where they're offering almost um, those remote types of you know degrees because they do recognise with with more improved technology, you know, uh, uh, materials being available online, that maybe students are finding it difficult to go and physically do a degree nowadays, so that, that they are they, they do seem to be studying maybe more remotely. Yeah, I think right across all universities, you're seeing a greater demand for an online option, mm -hmm. um, and certainly that's always been the space that we've been in, and mm -hmm. I think it's. It, we are continuing to up our efforts to make sure that's what we can do. I think the thing we offer differently to some providers in the private sector is that these, these are accredited courses. Mm -hmm. So it is university credit that people can get if they want to work with the Open University. One thing that we've just started, um, we have a, 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 an organisation called FutureLearn, which the university set up probably, I'll get the date wrong, but probably about six or seven years ago. Um, we're starting to offer with our partner universities as well as the Open University, a thing called micro-credentials, which is essentially 10-point courses. And I think that's targeted at people that are in work who can get a solid credit in a short space of time and then build up a qualification in and around that, again, in a mixed environment. So I think we're confident within our space that we're continuing to push hard uh, to make sure that we keep in line with technology. We are do we're creating the sort of courses that people want to do. And, and that we review them fairly flexibly as well. Um, in, in terms of other universities on the island, we work very cooperatively, uh, and I think we are complementary in what we do, as we are very different um, um, and yet the same. Uh, so the fact that we don't have classrooms, that our, our methodology is reaching directly to the students. One of the good things we get from our students is that they have a personal tutor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have to say, uh, and this is, this is underneath the fact that we get very high student satisfaction ratings, uh, the tutors we have really do go the extra mile. Um, they build a relationship because a typical degree person will spend five, six years with the university. Um, so we do take a lot of personal pride in getting that person over the line. Um, so I think the technology thing will always be on the up for us. We're, we're looking at how we can improve the digital experience for all of our students from even you know, getting basic information about what a course entails to actually having access to solid educational materials on a mobile phone, which sometimes is a challenge even in terms of screen size. But that's the way I think more and more people want to learn. They want to be able to learn at times that they can learn on. So whether if you're sitting on a bus, or uh, you're, you're at your lunch, um, you can have access to your whole virtual learning experience. Um, and we're involved in a major technology development program within the university, really, to make us 
solid in terms of that infrastructure. Um, so it's an exciting space to be in. We also have a huge YouTube channel. Um, so if you go onto Open University on YouTube, you will find lots of lectures, lots of examples of our course materials. So we try to use every avenue to get out to our students. And again, social media is a way that we've piloted as well with some of our student groups using Facebook groups to see if that helps engage students. Um, and we have a very active students association who are, I have to say, excellent at giving us feedback in terms of what we need to do better. Um, and that's also one of the reasons we're really pleased to be working with libraries in Northern Ireland, because some of our students in rural areas haven't got the best broadband in the world, but with the fantastic um, access we have to libraries uh, across 96 locations, um, that, that's, a, that's a nice relationship to move forward in the future. Okay, I suppose leading on from that, I am aware of a private sector organisation who are encouraging people to, to do degrees yeah. and use the opportunity of uh, getting an undergrad where they previously haven't and the student loans to be able to do that. And they're being accredited from universities outside of Northern Ireland, but they are offering this service within Northern Ireland. Um, I would prefer that they're being accredited by a Northern Ireland university. Um, but I, I suppose that's where I'm starting to see others trying to get into the space of what you're doing. And, and I wonder, is that a, a, an emerging kind of challenge for yourself? I think I think um, it, it, it's quite interesting, Claire, because um, we, as part of our, our, our online model, um, we build up all our support mechanisms for students around that, mm -hmm. um, which is actually quite challenging for yeah. other institutions to do. So, yeah, so absolutely, <coughs> um, it's becoming easier and easier to present programs online. Um, but I think the the kind of unique capability that the OU has is to, ha is to maintain that individualised support model mm -hmm. around each student. So there, there are alternative ways of mm -hmm. getting degrees online, but I think our model, um, so even in terms from our course design, mm -hmm. um, the learning design methodology we have is really, really robust to ensure that students are um, getting a, a really high quality learning experience. Um, and we are under rigorous um, uh, kind of scrutiny from QAA around the, the quality of what we do, and mm -hmm. that's important and good. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we stand over how we do our online um, provision. But I think it's that support model mm -hmm. in particular that, that really sets us apart. So okay. we have a student support team based in, in Belfast um, of around 30 people okay. who provide um, really quite individualised support on top of the associate lecturer, mm. who each student will be allocated to in, in a relatively small tutor group um, as well. And that's actually very, very difficult for other institutions to replicate. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I would encourage any, any student to also look at the support model mm -hmm. that goes alongside, not just the endpoint of a, a, a degree sure. award as well. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, I suppose from these other organisations, they would say something similar. Um, I know I've met with them, and that, that they are saying that this is what they provided. Just I suppose you know, put it on your radar that yeah. it now feels yeah. that there yeah. are other. Types. And if you don't mind, one last one, chair. I, I'm really interested in your uh, relationship with the further education colleges. I, I do think that we underutilise the FE colleges in Northern Ireland in being able, in particular, to provide vocational type subjects, which are very much specific to the needs of of, of business. Um, in particular, the cyber security one. Um, I know from my previous role, um, there's big interest in cyber security in Northern Ireland. And indeed, if you were to join the police and train yourself up in that, we almost lose an awful lot of police officers because of how highly skilled they are in this area. And a police salary doesn't pay what particularly a big company pays. So I suppose it's, um, it's about really exploiting the, the skills that we do very well here. And, um, and how we could roll that out, you know, not just in Belfast Met, but indeed the other regional colleges, particularly in my own constituency, I'd be quite keen to see you do that. We've been very impressed at how collaborative the colleges are. So yeah. the work that Belfast Met started in cyber security, that's now being shared with Southern Regional College. Okay, so good. I think what we're seeing now, Claire, is if you go back to FE Means Business, which is yeah. a long, long time ago, that aspiration of colleges collaborating on a regional basis, I think you're seeing that really happen. We've been very impressed with the three colleges we're working with so far, mm -hmm. and, and we're very impressed by the approaches we're getting from other colleges mm -hmm. as well. Um, they're challenging us with the pace that they want to move at, which we think is absolutely brilliant. Um, I have to say, um, I was personally involved in the accreditation of Southwest College, mm -hmm. and when um, the visiting panel came, they were impressed at the estate that the college had across their campuses in that area, um, the, the passion of the staff, um, and the really um, 
fantastic feedback that the college got from students because um, you know, that, that's what we're all about. It's about creating a difference in a student's life. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we think our, our interactions with colleges will increase greatly. Um, and so far, I think it's been a win-win both for the colleges and for the university. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Janine. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, John and Michael, for your presentation. Um, I mean, in, in relation to the student recruitment and growth, what is, you, you said that the, gen, the, the average age would be about 31. Is that coming down? Or, yes. Yeah, because I would suspect that the flexibility of the courses and the, and the manner in which they're delivered digitally would be very attractive mm. for a younger cohort. And um, based, based on that, um, it's a bit like online shopping. It's growing um, because people want flexibility and they want to be able to do it in their own time and at their own pace. Um, how are you project projecting um, growing and the challenges of growing uh, the university here in Northern Ireland? And how many students would you have graduating every year, for example, okay. in Northern Ireland? I need to get that figure for you in terms right. of numbers graduating, um, because we're a modular university. Yes. It takes a while uh -huh. for that to come through. But certainly, at our degree ceremony in Belfast last October, I think we had an excess of 300. About 300, was it? 300 graduates. Um, not everybody wants to graduate, um, because being the big machine that we are, when you get your degree, your certificate arrives in the post. Um, so we try and market the degree ceremony as a celebration with your peers. So not every so, uh, but we will get that figure for you, Sinead. I think you're absolutely right. Um, we've noticed a decline in the average age consistently over the last number of years, and that's been noticeable also in Scotland, Wales, and in England. Because I think a lot of people are are seeing the benefits of, of getting a job and getting experience because this sometimes feeds into some of the feedback that you get from some of the business organisations where employers want someone with work experience plus qualifications. So we are increasingly seeing that um, dynamic of, of younger people studying part time with us. Um, and that adds a lot of vibrancy to what we do as well. And that's again a driver for us to make sure that we're able to deliver our learning in, in digital ways, uh, face to face as well, which is very important. And we still supply all the textbooks to students. So um, your postman may not be your friend after a little while if you start <laughs> studying with the Open mm -hmm. University because mm -hmm. these large cardboard boxes will arrive. So we have that. Um, we're more than just online, it's actually, I suppose, blended learning is probably the right sort of term. Uh -huh. We are seeing much, much more of our students wanting to access things digitally. Um, and again, you can download all your course materials, you can annotate files now, so it's a very, very different environment. And we, we, it's some of the stuff that we do in our open days is just demonstrating that flexibility of learning. In relation to cost of courses, um, do, what's the variation? Uh, do you charge more, you know, by <coughs> module, or do you charge uh, from degree end, or, or what is it to the student? For, for first of all, we, we would charge on a, on a modular basis. So a thir thirty credit points is five hundred and four pounds. Sixty credits is a thousand and eight pounds. So if you go for the full degree with us, um, it would be around about six thousand pounds. Uh, and again, some people will do that over six years. Some people will do it a little bit shorter. Some people will take more than six years. But from a value point of view, um, a lot of feedback we get for our students is if you're getting a degree for £6,000, plus all your materials, plus all the support, that works for them. Obviously, there's other students prefer the traditional way of, of going to a university over a three-year period. And I, I think it's healthy for a region like ourselves to have that range of choice. Um, but you know the feedback we get is that's very good value. It's it's really good value compared to England because um, yeah. the English fee is around about. Make well keep me right in this. That's six seven thousand pounds per year. So a degree with the Open University in England is in excess of twenty thousand pounds, and that's because um, praise where it's due. Uh, Northern Ireland Assembly, Scottish Parliament, and the Welsh Assembly are continuing to fund the Open University mm. in that teaching grants sort of way. So that's why we can have a different price. Uh, range across the United Kingdom. In relation to the provision um, within nursing, um, you compete or you, 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 you work with the Department of Health. Uh, what kind of level of uh, support do they give you per nurse? Um, and, and how does that reflect 
the amount of money they would give, for example, to Ulster University for, for nursing? Is, what's the differentiation between the two uh, levels of support? So our students don't receive the, um, the, the maintenance bursary. Yeah. So that goes towards the, the cost of the, the, the fee and um, is used um, I suppose more, more, more creatively um, because they are getting, they still maintain their um, salary through their existing role. So they don't get the, the, means to, the, the, the maintenance bursary that other students would get. Uh, and then that money would then be reinvested or in fee. And um, the other resource implications for the trust are if a student has to um, go on placement, then that ward um, or trust is backfilled. Um, to allow them to bring in extra staff to, to cover. Um, so overall, it's a comparable amount per student. Um, it's just funded slightly differently than, than what a Queen's and Ulster student would be, due to the student being in employment within the trust. OK, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon? Thanks very much, gentlemen. Michael and John, good to see you both again. You too, Gordon. Um, you, you haven't talked a lot about funding, core funding. Um, you don't have the bag and roll out that most organisations <laughs> do. So we uh, welcome that. I, uh, obviously, you get a, quite a bit of support through, through this Department of Economy. Yeah. Yeah. They're the main core funders. Yeah. 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 And then obviously, income from fees and so on. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Given you've raised it, Gordon, we, 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 we are, we, um, in terms of our, our student numbers, um, we are, I suppose, due to the significant growth yes. that we've experienced, particularly over the last three years, um, fairly considerably underfunded per, per student yeah. number. Um, uh, as, so, so we're not getting the full teaching grant per student. Um, that's something we'll be in discussions with the, the department, and that's in some ways we've been yeah. a, a victim, victim of our own success. And we've taken the decision not to cap our, our numbers. Um, I, I suppose... You know, we're keen to do more, um, and we think that, you know, Shanine, you mentioned about growth, we think there is more growth, we think there's more people who, with a bit of extra support, um, could, uh, could uh, embark on their educational journey with us. Um, so, so, yes, I think we're, we, 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 you know, we're covering the cost of things. Yeah, um, okay. I, I, th I, think, I think more growth at the same um, we would we, we begin to have our, our finance director breathing down our, our necks, yeah. but um, so we, we have taken the, the you know, promoting the positive elements that we do rather than... Well, you've done that very well, well today too. Yeah. And, and we, we are in positive discussion with the yeah. department, yeah. Uh, the funding board yeah. and the case where they're seeing the benefits of the university is driving growth in the part-time sector, the adult uh, lifelong learning approach, and also the collaboration that we're seeing with colleges in particular, but yeah. with other statutory partners like Libraries Northern Ireland uh, and others. Um, and again, Do they charge you, by the way, Library Service? No. No? No. Yeah. We're, we're helping each other. Um, no, it's I just suppose a benefit for them, Gordon, is they will get increased footfall from our students, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Um, so again, that, it's a positive benefit for both organisations. But I think in terms of discussions we have with the department, obviously our running costs are probably less than a traditional university in that we don't have huge buildings and all that sort of infrastructure. Um, so I think you know the, the difference we're talking about is, is not going to be that huge. But it will be significant in terms of us, as you say, Sinead, building more growth for the future to enrich the lives of people um, both from a well-being point of view and an economic point of view and also inspiring their children and their, their peers to sort of progress and, and make as good a life as, as they can for their families here. And the course is, a, the course is designed by the various bodies or do you get involved directly in course design? Or? Yeah, we, we would, our academic teams would design the courses and often they would then be accredited by yeah. the relevant body. So, for example, nursing is, we're actually going through our um, Nursing and Midwifery Council um, uh, accreditation programme. We have a team from NMC coming over yeah. next, next Monday, week. actually, to, to Northern Ireland to, to see what we do here. So, um, so, yeah, we would, our academic teams would design, develop the courses and then receive accreditation 
from the various yeah. bodies. The, the college courses that we're working on are often being directly driven by the industry themselves. So the, again, yeah. to reference yeah. the work Belfast Met have done in cyber security, that's working in partnership with major IT suppliers. Um, so that course is very precise to the industry. The custom built, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, okay. And I think that says a lot, Gordon, about why the numbers they're putting through are phenomenal. Uh, which, uh, you know, as, as Clara said, that, that really does tap into the rich talent base we have in Northern Ireland in that cyber security IT area. Good. Keep up the good work, Brett. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. John. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm one of your students. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 what are your <laughs> I, I, I'll just check your record here, John. Don't. Let's go through it. Third. Uh, <laughs> it's Patsy, that's what that was. Uh, but I, uh, I really do enjoy the coursework. Uh, I'm not so fussed on the, the TMAs on the exams, uh, but yeah, I really yeah. enjoy the coursework. And I'm, I'm in that category, and I was surprised, though, well, when I look at and reflect on some of the examination halls I've been in, in terms of the average age of participants at 35, uh, the first time I went into the exam hall about a couple of years ago, I realised I was the oldest person in the room. <laughs> I would have been 51 then. So, you know, so I, I, I entered the, the coursework on the basis of, of the joy of learning. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, when you get to my age in life. Well, I may change career pathway, the accurate may decide that for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you may change career pathway at any stage. But it, it, is that, and it is that sector, I think, where there, there is appeal, where, where people, and I, to me that is the core of education, the joy of learning, the self-fulfillment. Of course there is an economic benefit to it, there's a skills benefit, all those benefits. But the core of education is self-fulfillment. Uh, and I think there is, the, there, there is an age group around my age group and older who I think could be encouraged back into learning yeah. uh, particularly through the Open University because I have found that accessibility is, is very good, the, the support is very good, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it was recommended to me by a colleague here to, to try it. So I think that's something you should, and I'm not sure how you appeal to my age group or older, but it's certainly a market you should be appealing to. Yeah. Traditionally, we, we've always had that sort of market, um, but I think you're right, John. It's it's that joy of learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, President Higgins made a statement the other day about university life, and it shouldn't always be about employability. It should yeah. be about the wider educational mm -hmm. aspects. Mm -hmm. And certainly, if we look at our numbers across faculties, you will see creative writing, uh, the art subjects, art history, remaining very, very strong. Um, and in fact, a number of years back, we, we did sort of a, a strategic planning exercise looking at what the hot topics would be. And of course, the people voted with their feet in a different way. Things like creative writing were still very, very popular. So there is a, a you're absolutely right, we need to maintain how we reach out to people. And as Michael said, one way we do that is through community groups and encouraging people to think about education again. The great advantage we have is that you can start with a little bit of informal learning on open learn uh, and those figures are, are, are amazing like thousands of people doing creative writing succeed with yeah. mathematics introductions to cyber security and then hopefully that can topple someone into thinking about that first 30 point course and that's the, that's where michael's team come in in terms of encouraging people to take that first step uh, i'm really pleased what you're saying about the, the support you're getting from our from our lectures and from our support staff because that's the engine of the Open University. It's that personal touch uh, with, with the student. It's that encouragement. It's that you know, maintain, trying to keep you on balance with your timetable to make sure you do, are able to submit your TMA on time. Uh, and I think we're very lucky to have staff like that in the Belfast office. But and, and, and we will pick up on what you say. <coughs> where we get the age range right, because you know our whole mantra is education for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a credit to the university that we still maintain the open access policy that you don't necessarily have to have a rack of A levels, a rack, a, a rack of GCSEs to to undertake study with us. If a, if a subject area requires prerequisite materials, we'll always ensure that we get people to that point before they start, because we never want to set so someone up to fail. But open access, I think, has been a real real benefit for us. Um, my tutor said my writing is creative, but it's not read. <laughs> 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 but in terms of, uh, one of the things the department or the committee will be looking at is in terms of broadband, and we're looking at uh, mm. Project Stratum, yeah. particularly broadband into rural communities. Have you any research or evidence to suggest that rural communities are disadvantaged in accessing new materials as a result of poor broadband? That's, that's, that's a really, really interesting point, because, um, John, because it's, it's something that we as a university grapple with in terms of the accessibility of, of our entire provision. Because um, one of the things 
and the temptation is to continually invest in newer and newer technology and is more and more reliant on the high-speed broadband, but right across students, you know, across these islands, um, broadband is, is patchy. So what we have tried to do with our core provision as much as possible is to ensure that um, it, it's as accessible for most broadband or you know, most internet speeds. So we don't put too much mm -hmm. high-res material and video uh, directly mm -hmm. em embedded within our courses for that kind of a reason. Mm -hmm. But it's trying to find that balance in terms of how you move on with technology and maintain yeah. that access. It does it does come up a wee bit, pro actually probably um, more so in, in uh, the Republic of Ireland, actually. Um, we, we, we have it probably more prom prominently than in the, in the north. Um, but it, it, it's, I think, because we're quite sensitive around it, we aren't having too many um, people directly contact us to say that they're they're unable to access their their online materials. But you know, it's it's a, a wider issue around broadband. The, the more reliable a network would be, the more creative technologies and things that we could use. Because that's one of the reasons that we have to be very mindful around accessibility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Good to see you again, John. Um, the, the sort of history graduate in me sa says you're absolutely right uh, about Wilson and his vision. But the right winger in me would point out, <laughs> would point out that it was Mrs. Thatcher that saved the OU when, oh, the, when the Tories oh, wanted to oh, abolish oh. it. So you can thank Maggie Thatcher for being an OU yeah. student, uh, John. Um, <laughs> that would be creative, ready. And in, terms of, um, in terms of the the nursing course that that you offer, I was wondering. You know, lots of people who would have a natural affinity for, for teaching, mm -hmm. uh, particularly working with young kids, mm -hmm. but because they didn't do, you know, BA or BSc, then a PGCE, you know, at Strand or St Mary's, and then into teaching, that, that route wouldn't have been open to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, given the success that there's been in, in nursing, mm -hmm. are you thinking of developing something similar for teaching? We, we did have a PGCE, yeah. uh, which was very successful and very highly rated by the ETI. But unfortunately, um, there was a, a strategy change and a policy change in England uh, by Minister Gove at that time, which essentially priced the Open University out of the market in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, recently, however, Christopher, in Wales, we're now doing a PGCE. Um, I think it's just in its first year, Michael, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, so we're, we're looking at how that pans out, and we would be very happy to sort of look at that model with Minister Weir. Um, it was very popular because it was really appealing. To, it was a secondary school uh, PTC, so it was appealing to people who maybe had worked in the IT sector and then did the yeah. PTCE, so they were going in as if you like, industry experienced teachers. Yes. It's a model we would love to look at again, but unfortunately the economics just didn't stack didn't up stack at that up. time. Yeah. But it was um, the, but it was the highest rated um, PGC course, course in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, I hope, hopefully we can make some progress on that. In terms of the, the course that you offer for um, the PSNI, could you just talk to me about that and what that's like? And yeah, yeah. Um, so. It, it, it kind of emanated from Fresh Start um, when the PSNI were looking at ways of, of upskilling um, officers. And uh, long story short, <laughs> <laughs> and we're lucky that the PSNI are, are actually members of the, the policing consortium that the Open University um, runs through our centre of policing centrally as mm. well with, with police um, bodies from. Uh, from across England, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. Um, so what we ended up developing was a course hosted on our OpenLearn platform on collaborative problem solving for community safety, um, which was developed with um, one of our local um, business associate lecturers who had previously done work with the police, who was very yeah. familiar with the environment, with the academics based in Milton Keynes uh, and with the police. Um, and that's course, it's hosted on OpenLearn, so actually anyone can, can right, go okay. and have a look at it. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most um, uh, popular courses on OpenLearn. Um, but it has really evolved from being focused just on existing officers to actually being a prerequisite for new officers coming right. in to the, the um, college in Garneville. 
um, and we have developed two more courses which are being hosted on OpenLearn, uh, and I think there's another two or three on being planned over the, the next number of um, years. So it's it's been really good. You know, officers can do it when they're potentially on desk duty or whenever they're out and about on their mobile phones and and all sorts of things. So it's actually it's it's been incredibly successful. The police have been delighted with mm. how it has went. And one of the nice things about hosting it on OpenLearn, which I know the police have been keen to explore, is they can use that as a tool to engage with the community and say that we're doing this course around collaborative problem solving. Mm. You know, you might want to have a look at it too, just to let you know these are the sorts of ways in which we're trying to improve how we engage lo with local communities. Um, so I think that's also evolving because that's been one of the really interesting aspects of it. So, so yeah, it's been been very, very successful, very positive, and yeah. looking forward to continuing that. In terms of outreach to sort of hard to reach communities or people that have you know, maybe fallen out of the education system early on in life. I see at point 17, you know, the community partnerships with Falls, Ballybean, Shankill and Kilcooley. What, what are the numbers like there in terms of the total number of participants? Um, at the minute this year, we had about 25, I think. At each across, location? In, you know, across the four, so they're yeah. relatively small groups. Um, so um, I think Ballybean has the largest cohort. Um, okay. Falls and Shankill have kind of supported each other. There's only a couple in, in Shankill. There's a slightly larger group in Falls, and they've actually supported each other, which has been really good. Um, and Kilcooley um, have a decent cohort as well, probably around seven or eight or so. And what are the sort of courses they're doing there? So the um, Kilcooley's focused around uh, introduction to health and social care, which is an actual... Um, Extension of their work. Actual, yeah. Yes. yes. So it, it's quite focused in, on that sector and for, for people who want to move into that sector. And the others are based around our access provision. Um, so that's our kind of pre yeah. degree level um, study, which gives a kind of broad overview and gets people used to doing assignments, gets used to people doing learning. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm wanting to do a bigger evaluation around it because it's particularly around those communities. Yes, there have been really successful employment outcomes from mm. previous students going through. But the impact on wellbeing, um, I think, is, is really significant. Um, and that's something that, uh, particularly with the you know, high levels of, of mental health mm. issues that we have um, across a lot of our communities in, in Northern Ireland, um, engaging education and learning can be a really, really positive way of um, of working through a lot of those issues, so so that's been interesting. So it is it is quite small scale, um, but one of the things we will be looking at is how we expand that up in the kind of sustainable, scalable model. Mm -hmm. It still reaches and provides extra support um, into specific communities. I just think that the, I mean the principles around delivering education in a non-traditional way for which the OU was founded yeah. mm -hmm. are as are actually probably more relevant mm -hmm. today yeah. than they were in 1969. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, diversifying the ways in which we can yeah. reach out into communities is, is something that's really important. Yeah. And particularly, I mean, I have in my constituency office, you know, it's in Sandy Row, yeah. and there are, you know, people there who the traditional educational system failed them and um, I went to Nelfield Primary School in the bottom of the Woodstock Road, exactly the same sort of socio-economic background. 40 of us did the 11 plus, 4 of us got it, got to the grammar school. So many of the people that were in my primary school class were failed by this, you know, you do, you do the transfer test, then you do the GCSEs, then you do the A-levels, then you go to university. That, that route doesn't work for so many people, and that's where I think the value of an institution like yours is to be found, and it still is. So, as as Gordon said, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for coming in to speak to us. You're right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Gary. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and I suppose just to agree with what everybody has said, I think it's been a very useful briefing, uh, especially for for some of us as new members of this committee. Uh, it has been particularly useful, and I suppose, like um, I suppose, what, what John has said, a lot of this, uh, given the particular particular age groups as well, uh, a lot of it's word of mouth. I think a lot of people, you know, here 
of someone who's went to Open University uh, and and they made a success of it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe John can report back to us in terms of how he gets on. And we can we, we can we can score him. But, Very confidential. But, 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 but in saying that, I, I I I do know of another MLA who's went down that route and uh, uh, and people, as you say, for, for just out of the enjoyment of it, uh, wanting to that, that sort of lifelong learning piece. Uh, and, the, and the final line. Uh, of your uh, the, the report that you've given to us, you said that the, the Open University in Northern Ireland works across a number of departments, which we know, uh, and you would like to see and do more in a streamlined way. Can you give us an example of some of those challenges and what you would like to see streamlined? Um, I, I think there's a willingness um, across departments to work collaboratively, but sometimes when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, you hit little bumps in the road. Mm. Um, I think the model we have with the Department of Health is, is a good one. Mm. Um, I suppose the one I would really like to explore is, is with Minister Weir in terms of um, how we can get that aspiration within large numbers of um, kids um, prior to making a decision about a college or university or job, that they can see the lifelong opportunity that is there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, Gary, it, it's just reaching out to other departments and um, I, I suppose it's, it's not even a, a, around the funding, it's just getting that space where different organisations can talk proactively and come up in a collaborative way. One of the ways we'd want to move forward also is working with local councils as part of their, their uh, larger uh, plans. Um, so it's just getting this place a bit more joined up. It's a, it's a small area, three excellent universities, six wonderful colleges. Mm -hmm. um, our former vice chancellor, who was from Australia, thought this was the golden place yeah. um, because you know there's, there's, it, it's, it's a small area. We've got great people. It's just getting that connectivity a little bit better. And I think the aspirations of New Decade, New Approach and the Programme for Government set out a, a, a pathway that we can explore usefully together. So we, we would love to be working across more of the departments. I think there's a willingness there. It's just getting, I suppose, the time and the opportunity. But also, um, what do we want to do that's going to be useful? Because mm. um, you can be as collaborative as anything and get nowhere. Um, it's getting that big ticket item that we want to do. So for us, it would be probably enhancing what we do in health, um, breaking new ground potentially with the Department for Education, because I think we, we did some um, visits to schools in East Belfast a couple of years ago, and both teachers and students were really impressed at the free learning that we've got. And then, as other colleagues have said, that flexibility afforded by digital learning. And for that generation of young people, they are so digitally savvy. Um, it's a very natural way for them to progress. <coughs> and I suppose it's also getting that balance between starting a career, doing your study, will be very attractive to some 16, 18 year olds, yes. maybe more so than the traditional route. But I think the great value that we have as a region is, you know, we've got three very different universities, excellent in, in what they do. Um, and then that underpinning college environment, which I think what we've been able to demonstrate over the last couple of years is a very vibrant way of, of helping people progress their life. Okay. I think as well, actually, um, Gary, there's from the, the work that OECD has been doing on the new skills strategy for Northern Ireland, really, really interesting themes coming out of that. And it looks like lifelong learning is going to be one of the key pillars of that, which will hopefully migrate into the new skills strategy. So I think um, a lot of the, the positive work that's going on there will hopefully, you know, we, we can strongly align to uh, and will provide more opportunities for us to, to reach out into to some of those communities and the things like economic inactivity. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a massive structural issue within our economy. and. Mm. Um, it will require a multifaceted way of, of trying to support people <coughs> employment and I think there's a role through some of our um, models to, to support yeah. some of no, those individuals. Too. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that and, and I just want to say given the fact that many of the questions have been covered I think it is important that uh, you know this conversation I appreciate that you won't be thinking this way but it shouldn't end here certainly from, from my perspective yeah. as constituency MLAs indeed uh -huh. as, a, as a committee no doubt we've we want to keep that sure. uh, ongoing conversation. If we can be of any assistance, uh, certainly as constituency MLAs as well, um, just just get in touch uh, because I think we do need to build a network uh, and try and address some of the challenges that sit maybe outside of your remit, but that you certainly yeah. have a, a, a role to play. Thank you. Thank you. Claire just wants to come back in for a quick one. Yeah, thank you, Chair, for having me back in. Um, 
I'm also a student, albeit with Ulster. Um, one of the what made that possible for me is how I was able to self-fund that. So I was able to break the cost down over three years, and then break the cost down within those years over five uh, kind of instalments. How does the funding model work for Open University in that respect? Because to me, that would make it much more accessible for people who are self-funding it and do want to, you know. So. Yeah. It, it was ending up around two, two fifty a month over five. Yes. You know, so it made yeah. it more accessible for. Yeah. Um, we, we have a variety of options, okay. um, Claire. With, with something similar, so so you can pay your module fees up front. Um, okay. You, so so usually it would be modular, um, with the access of the you know, in, in the postgraduate mm -hmm. world, the, the postgraduate loan mm -hmm. um, is is available for yeah. for okay. university students, um, as is the undergraduate loan and. Um, and course grant as well for part-time mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. We also run um, what we call the USPA, which is essentially a, it's a it's a that enables people to so essentially USPA, which is a sort of slightly separate organisation, pays the fee up front, and then the student pays USPA back in instalments in okay. the similar way that you're describing. So it's just another way of okay. of enabling that. Um, so, so yeah, we, we have a variety of okay. different ways to try and mm -hmm. enable people to manage their, okay. their finances around it. Thank you. John, Michael, thank you very much. It's been thank really you. informative and I'm sure we'll continue our conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, moving on to our next um, item, I'd like to invite our um, members from Queen's University, please. And a welcome to our meeting, um, Professor Ian Greer, Professor Richard English, uh, and Ms. Jo Clegg. Um, and when these are ready, do we want to wait until people coming back, or are we okay? Yeah, no, we're still yeah, quorum. We're still quorum, so we're okay to go ahead. Can I start off? Yep, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, first of all, for giving us the opportunity to, to come and address you. And there's three issues that I'd like to raise with the committee this morning. The first is how we develop a sustainable funding model for higher education in Northern Ireland. The second is how we deliver place-based investment to support both north-south and east-west initiatives that can drive collaboration and drive the economy. And thirdly, I'd like to ask the question, what can Queen's do for Northern Ireland? We want to be able to work in partnership with government to address major issues such as health and climate change. We want to be engaged and involved as you develop policy and indeed with your programme for government. Because only through that partnership can we address some of the serious inequalities that I'd like to talk about today. But perhaps I should start by way of context with the economic challenges that we have. And having the executive up and running at this time is critically important because of these economic challenges. You don't need me to tell you that we've got one of the lowest areas in the UK for GVA per person. We've got the largest negative budget balance, which is government revenue minus government expenditure of any part of the UK. To address that, we're going to have to make difficult decisions that can only be made with common purpose and, of course, with a long-term vision to make a real difference to our economy. Now, it's well recognised that innovation is a key lever of economic growth and, indeed, job creation. There's a clear need in the UK to level up the regions only three regions in the UK contribute positively to the Exchequer. All the rest are negative. The UK has seen declining levels in research and innovation investment versus its competitors. Germany, France, the USA, Japan were lagging behind all the major competitors. So the government set a target, a target of 2.4% of GDP to be invested in research and innovation. That's not a high target. That's the average for the G7 countries. It's nowhere near the top. But it's a significant increase from where we are. And of course, universities are absolutely key to that ambition. And it's important that we drive that ambition to level up the regions. Despite the importance of universities, we see inequalities in investment and funding. So in Northern Ireland, only 100 euros per person 
is invested from government and higher education and non-profit R&D, according to the Eurostat figures from 2014. Compare that with Scotland, which gets over €300 Euros per person, and London almost €400 Euros per person. We have also got a low level of business R&D spend. So economically, we are weak and we are subject to significant inequality of R&D funding. I believe that is a compelling case for R&D investment, targeted specifically to drive up productivity in key areas and, of course, level up the UK and drive our economy here in Northern Ireland forward. Now, the universities in Northern Ireland can make a real difference here. We are very strong in areas such as translational research and innovation. Couple that with the development of skills, and we really can drive productivity and economic growth. A good example, perhaps, is Sheffield's Advanced Manufacturing Centre, which was built on the site of an old coal mine just outside Sheffield. It's attracted substantial inward investment, it's driven skills, it's driven economic change from nothing in a matter of 10 to 20 years. So we need, I believe, place-based investment, this is not a devolved issue, place-based investment to drive up our productivity, to drive up our economy, to attract inward investment, to allow our SMEs to grow and allow spin-outs to be created. As policymakers, you've got a really central role in creating that increase in productivity, in driving an inclusive economy, and we want to help you. We want to work with you to make a real difference. So what are our credentials? What are the credentials of Queen's University to play in this space? Well, on an independent analysis, our total impact on the economy is £1.9 billion a year. That's over six to one in terms of benefit to cost. That's a fantastic return. And if you look at it in terms of direct government funding, it's much higher. Another example. One million pounds of research spend from Queen's yields 3.9 million of economic impact through the spillover effect in the economy on other organisations. And that's why Queen's is the number one university in the UK for knowledge transfer partnerships. These are partnerships where you take a business problem, a university solution, and you put them together with a modest bit of support from Innovate UK, and you get that, that business problem solved and the business driven forward. We're also on the basis of an Octopus Ventures, a venture capital firm, objective analysis of all UK universities, the number one university for entrepreneurial impact. That's a really impressive place to be. And we're doing that despite the lack of place-based investment. Just think what we could do if it was higher. Directly, we employ 3,700 people. Indirectly, another 2,500. Eight international students coming to Queen's deliver £1 million of economic impact, and we bring over 3,000 international students to Northern Ireland. The Belfast Region City deal is worth over £225 million for the innovation component driven by the universities. Queen's itself has put £20 million into that Belfast Region City deal and development. The push advanced manufacturing, health research, creative industries, and the digital industries, which binds all of these areas together, and can make a real difference. So coming back to where I start, I said I wanted to talk to you about three things. The first was the sustainable funding model for Northern Ireland. Why do I want to talk about it? Because the current model fails. It fails the young people of Northern Ireland. It fails the widening participation community. And it fails to meet the needs of the economy. In short, it's a source of very serious inequality, which we should all be exercised about. Now, the performance of our universities in Northern Ireland is judged against our peers in England. But our funding is quite different. We receive around £1,500 per student per year less than our English peers. We have capped numbers. England don't have capped. We have only 60 higher education places for every 100 applicants in Northern Ireland. In England, it's 120 places for every 100 applicants, and in Scotland, 95. Last year, 31% of young people left Northern Ireland to pursue their education in Great Britain. The year before, 37%. So there are more than 14,000 students from Northern Ireland studying in Great Britain at present, and only 30% return. They receive their student support from Northern Ireland to go 
in Catholic education elsewhere. In Scotland, only around 4% leave, but they have a net influx of uh, quite a considerable number of almost 21%, so they have a net gain of 17%. In contrast, we have an influx of around 4% and a loss of over 31%, so at best, in a good year, we have got a net loss of 27% of students and in a bad year, 33% of students. That's a very serious inequality in distribution of opportunity for the young people in Northern Ireland. And it's damaging widening participation. At Queen's, 27% of our students come from the lowest uh, quintiles for deprivation. 45% of our students have a household income below 41,500, which is the upper threshold for Department for Economy Maintenance Grants. So this is a really important issue. And because of the capped numbers, Queen's rapidly fills up with students who are high attaining, often from a grammar school background. And that makes it harder to come in if you've gone to an integrated school or an independent school. We've got to cater for the whole of the population, and the current cap system is driving widening participation down. <clears throat> We're the only part of the UK where widening participation is stagnating and not improving. It's really important in discussions, especially in a forum like this, to understand that the level of tuition fee does not directly link to widening participation. It's much more complex. Mm -hmm. So in England, the tuition fee is £9,250 per year, and widening participation has increased dramatically. Here, the fee is just over £4,000, and widening participation is at best stagnating and at worst getting worse. So it's an important and difficult area. The Queen's is committed to doing something here. We can and we will do more, but we have been limited by the inequalities that I discussed in terms of funding and the cap numbers. We've got a Pathways Opportunity Programme, which we started two or three years ago. It's now got 250 students on it. We support them through the last two years of their secondary education. We support them with a small bursary when they get to Queen's. We, they all get a conditional offer. And we've brought in contextual entry, which means we can drop grades for people who come from a disadvantaged background. That's really important. It's also supported by philanthropy, not by money from the Exchequer. And we're driving our philanthropic giving in that direction. I can't tell you how important it is. If you just look at students attaining five good GCSEs, in the grammar school system here in Northern Ireland, the, the rate is 94% of students get five good GCSEs. In other secondary schools, it's only 52%. That's an enormous difference. And so we really do need to have initiatives like the Pathway Opportunity Programme that we run or contextual entry to make a real difference. Now, it's also a problem in terms of the cap numbers and funding because we don't meet the needs of the economy. The city deals or the regional growth deals across Northern Ireland are forecast to deliver more than 30,000 jobs over the next few years. I have no idea where we're going to fill these jobs from because we don't have the graduate workforce to do it. If we want to fill these jobs, we need to be starting to educate people now in the graduate system. Look at your skills barometer, which Austin University have been doing for the region. If you just look at the gaps in engineering, math, computer science, and history and philosophy, there's a 900 places per year gap to meet the needs of our economy. So we need a sustainable funding model to increase our economic impact through both skills and innovation. We are happy to work with, whatever, work with whatever model you decide is the right one for Northern Ireland, but we want it to be really effective. There are different models in England and Scotland. You could have a completely different model and go for a graduate levy of businesses, for example. We are completely open-minded. We want to work with you to get a model that works. But in any model, it's absolutely critical at the very start that we look after widening participation and improve social mobility. In any model, we've got to make sure that our system is joined up. You've heard from our colleagues in the Open University about the importance of working with further in ed higher education together. We would emphasise that. If we want to improve social mobility, we need better integration between further education and higher education. We are working with Belfast Met and, for example, our computer science programmes now articulate directly. You can move straight from a Belfast Met course into a Queen's University course. And that opens the talent pipeline and drives the ability. 
Now, the second big issue I wanted to talk about, uh, as I highlighted at the beginning, is place-based funding to support both north-south and east-west initiatives. I believe we've got a really important window of opportunity to affect collaboration. Collaboration across industry, universities and government, and I would add to that the population, to create a quadruple helix that can drive economic growth. We want to harness the converging technologies of today to affect socio-economic change and deliver more equitable outcomes. There's been very major investment in the Republic of Ireland, very major investment across the UK with an industrial strategy. And we need that place-based investment to level up and make a real difference. I told you how unequal it was at the beginning. Only €100 Euros per person invested in the government side in research and innovation in Northern Ireland, a quarter of what happens in the southeast of England, less than a third of what happens in Scotland. We can do a lot more if we're funded appropriately. So we want to address important challenges for several sectors. Areas like artificial intelligence, data science, cyber security, precision medicine, the agri-food sector, or perhaps we take a mission-oriented goal and we look at, say, climate change, which requires investment in many sectors coming together. And when we look at the investment made south of the border, there's been a €2.2 billion Euro investment by the Irish government in higher education and research funding. Four hundred and sixty million in Science Foundation Island Research Centres, seven hundred and fifty PhDs in data science, a dramatic increase in undergraduate students. And that contrasts with the divestment of Northern Ireland higher education, where we've seen an absence of similar initiatives, yet we've got that need to grow the economy. And that's why I'm delighted to see you back in office and making a real difference. So that place based investment will allow Northern Ireland universities to make a real difference, to align with the UK industrial strategy, to drive collaborations across this island and put Northern Ireland at the forefront of technologies that can address <coughs> challenges. And finally, I said I wanted Queen's to be able to help government and provide solutions to key issues for Northern Ireland. So, of course, we've been studying the new decade, new approach. And it says the executive will support educating children and young people of different backgrounds together in the classroom. Just two weeks ago, I was in Buckingham Palace, where Queen's received the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Shared Education that did that very job, which brought together children from different parts of the community and educated them together. Queen's can make a difference. A new decade, new approach, it says the executive will reconfigure hospital provision to deliver better patient outcomes. This is really critical. We see very major inequalities in health. Disease-free life expectancy is something like 15 years different compared to the southeast of England. If you look at our waiting list, 120,000 people in Northern Ireland have been on a waiting list for more than a year. We have 1.8 million people. In England, they have just 1,200 people who have been waiting for more than a year and yet they have a population of 56 million. We need to sort out our health service. University leads like Queen's can do it. I can give you many examples. It could be a specific disease area like prostate cancer, where researchers of Queen's have got a new, new approach. They inject a hydrogel round the prostate gland to isolate it from other structures, and it means that you can give it a higher dose of radiation with fewer pulses and with a better outcome for the patient. Instead of having four weeks of radiotherapy, you have five days. The outcome's better, cost is lower. It's all done through research at Queen's. I could talk to you about the capacity in clinical trials to drive forward our whole healthcare economy. I could talk to you about health data that can change how we deliver healthcare and make a real difference. I can talk to you about how we drive medical student places up further. But if we're going to drive medical student places up, we've got to stop being a leaky bucket and we are a leaky bucket for doctors and nurses. So I believe we've got to ensure that if we drive up medical education and student numbers, we've got to stop them leaving by having a superb clinical postgraduate system for Northern Ireland, and we can deliver on that. Now, because of the service pressures on the NHS here, there is virtually no capacity in the health service to drive research and innovation. Yet we need innovation to transform services to give us better outcomes and more cost-effective services. In England, that's met through the National Institute for Health Research. 
That gets a billion pounds a year of investment, and it works by coupling up NHS problems and providers with universities to tackle significant problems that deliver translational research that drives forward the service. We don't have such funding here. We have brought together the whole sector in Northern Ireland with a new organisation called Tarani, the Health Innovation Research Alliance for Northern Ireland that brings all the assets of our sector together to make a real difference. So we can work with you to deliver on that one too. And also in the New Decade New Approach document it says let's tackle climate change. It's important that we do here because in the, the UK overall emissions have gone down 39% since 1990 and Northern Ireland our emissions are only down 16%. We've got a bit of catching up to do. So Queen's is working with Belfast City Council to create the Belfast Climate Commission, one of only three cities in the UK with such a commission. We've got the Bryden Centre, which was funded through European Interreg funding and from DEFI uh, to look at uh, renewable energy-based and tidal systems. So we can do a lot. And finally, I would say in New Decade New Approach, it talked about creating Northern Ireland as a global cyber security hub to achieve 5,000 cyber security professionals by 2030. The whole basis of our cyber security strength came from Queen's. So I have three asks. First ask is I would like us to address the sustainable funding problem for higher education. In doing so, it's critical that we protect and enhance widening participation, we enhance the student experience and we drive innovation and skills. Secondly, I would like your support to ensure that we can secure UK-based investment for innovation to drive forward that place-based investment that will help us with both north-south and east-west initiatives, the purpose being to level up Northern Ireland and make it really competitive with the rest of the UK. And the third ask is to allow us to work with you. We have to work in an integrated way with government as you develop policy, as you develop your programme for government and impact on our priorities in Northern Ireland many of which are key sustainable development goals like health, climate, education and skills. I hope this dialogue is the start of a long and fruitful partnership and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, Ian, um, and thank you for outlining very clearly um, some of the, the I suppose, challenges and opportunities there. Um, big, big challenges. I think we don't hear enough about the importance of, of research and innovation and the impact that it has on our economy. And I think um, that what you have outlined has been very useful in, in that respect. Um, and I think the, the clear links between investing in research and innovation and economic development are, are something that, we, that we, we need to, to focus on um, and that we all need to, to have a proper understanding of. And um, there has been an inability to, to invest um, here and to invest in the directions that, that, that we would like to do. Um, we also don't underestimate in any way the, the, um, the funding challenges um, and the need for a, a more sustainable and more equitable funding model. And from my own perspective, that conversation shouldn't be around student fees. It should be looking at, at wider um, the, the wider funding and the wider ability to direct funding um, in that respect. Um, and, you know, a priority of, of my own, and you, you will know this from conversations that we have had, has been around widening participation and, and improving access. And that has to be at the core of um, what we are trying to achieve in, in terms of, of uh, investing in further and higher education. And of course, the collaboration between all, all strands of those is something that we, we need to look at. And going into the future, how business also ties in in terms of that. I think that a priority for us all should be um, how we can work better together in terms of academia, um, government, and of course, business and industry to support each other. Because uh, as you have very clearly highlighted there at the end about how um, there are such innovative things happening in our universities <coughs> that can directly impact on some of the key challenges that, that we face in our, our public services. Uh, and the first way that that is going to be addressed is by us knowing about them. So, you know, we, we need to have these conversations, and I very, very much welcome um, what you have said. 
And I would also welcome the, the opportunity for us to have more of these conversations and, and to tease things out in greater detail where we can uh, have particular impacts. And you've mentioned the health service in particular, and I, I know that's a, a field that you have a lot of experience in yourself. Um, and there is a, a great deal that we potentially can do there um, if we have the, the opportunity to do it. Um, I'm going to let members ask some questions um, specifically and then come back in myself with that. That's OK. Shania, you're first. OK, thanks. Uh, thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, it's very sobering. Um, it's nothing that we didn't know already in terms of our economy is operating with its arm behind its back, uh, which is it's, it's incredible um, because we've been doing it for a long time. Um, we have a higher education provision that's very, very under-resourced uh, in many aspects within our R&D and, and, and within, more importantly, the actual fact that we cap our student numbers. We, we, we cap it based on cost savings and the impact that is then having on our uh, economy goes extremely wide and the fact that we are exporting so many of, of our children our greatest export in northern ireland seems to be our kids uh, and we do that on the basis of um, curtailing costs curtailing skilling our own people and whilst we um whilst the money for 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 supporting those students isn't from the block grant it is been paid for from the Treasury. So we're actually <coughs> paying to send our children away and most of them never to return to contribute back to Northern Ireland. It is absolutely the, the policy of madness what we are doing in Northern Ireland in relation to our education uh, and we do it uh, by design. Uh, and, and I can hear your passion and I can hear your frustration in that presentation there today. And I am equally, uh, I'm equally concerned about it. Now, we do have a problem, so we need to find a solution. Uh, and, and there are solutions to it. And if you look at what Scotland has done, when you look at the Republic of Ireland has done, if you look even at some, if you go right, right down to it, like some cities, like Galway and, and Cork, I mean, the massive investment that they have made in their student numbers and their provision and, 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 and making creative hubs uh, and that what it has done for, for developing the cities. We are ruining Northern Ireland. Every single year that we don't address the issues that we have straight in front of us and we fail to address it. Time and time again, we have a policy of, of, of self-harm when it comes to education and skills and developing the economy. And until we actually do something around that, we are going to continue to have the same outputs and the same problems and the same resource issues going forward again and again. So that's, so that's my rant. <laughs> that's the rant over. But how can we contribute? You, you, know, you, you put three questions to it. The sustainability of funding. And then you have asked us about the, the UK-based investment in R&D. That one is even more concerning because of the fact that we are now leaving the European Union and the R&D money that we would have normally, you know, horizons and things like that, it's going to be, you know, uh, capped. And I'm not quite sure of, of the commitment uh, of the UK Treasury to Northern Ireland based on, on, on their, um, the historical context of, of, uh, of that. And as, as far as working with Queen's, I would love from a constituency perspective that we could work more effectively with Queen's uh, within FOI as well, because we do see the, you know, the, 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 the great asset that you are to this region and we would like to release you <laughs> further in order that you can actually uh, contribute more to the economy. But definitely within place-based investment, I think that we should be uh, looking to see that if we can get more money, and we will need more money going forward uh, because we are leaving uh, the European Union in order to invest in our education and skills. Because if the UK is going to be competitive 
uh, and go out there into the global world. Well, the only way they can do it is with talent and skills and an educated workforce. And that is where the further education and the higher education and our 14 to 19 year old strategy comes in. So it's increased investment that is required. Again, uh, funding models, we, we've looked around at the best of them um, uh, and uh, throughout Europe. There are solutions to this problem. It's not always about tuition fees, but there are solutions to these problems. And we would like to continue, I would certainly like to continue to talk uh, more deeply uh, in relation to, to, to that. And that's suppose not a question, but it's a continuing conversation because this is not going to be solved overnight, but it certainly needs to be solved. Thank you. Well, naturally, I, I agree with all your points. And <laughs> with regards to where you started, I think it would be really good if we could move the conversation away from the cost to the value. Mm -hmm. And Queen's and Ulster and the Open University will all give a substantial return to the economy if you look at it holistically. It would be great to shift the conversation away from cost to value and what we can deliver. And take that value proposition too for the place-based funding. Because the government of the UK will get a return on that investment if we spend it wisely. And on your third point about the North West, we, we, we do have a strong presence there. but We perhaps don't shout about it enough. We've just um, made a major contribution to the development of Foyle River Gardens, which will be a major project. We've got over 1,800 clinical training places for undergraduate medical students mm -hmm. there. We do want to do more, we will do more, and we'd like to engage. We're Northern Ireland's university. We may be sited principally in Belfast, but we're here for the whole of Northern Ireland. Richard, would you like to add to that? Thank you. I agree with everything you've said, Vice Chancellor. I think the point you make about the comparison with losing people who don't return is crucial. I worked in Scotland before coming back to Queen's and the contrast between Scottish export of students, which is very, very small, and Northern Ireland is striking. About two thirds of the students from Northern Ireland who go to university in Britain don't come back. That does, as you and the Vice Chancellor have, have said, it does have an economic effect. But I noticed in Scotland it also has all sorts of cultural effects as well in terms of the kind of community people are growing up feeling that it is. Is it a welcoming community? Are they going to be able to contribute in terms of all sorts of areas of life? Are they going to be able to see a future for themselves in Scotland? And the contrast between the two settings is really stark. And, and for, as you say, from Northern Ireland's perspective, very depressing. It's not easy to find solutions, but I think we have to find them. And as you say, there are examples for that. Um, on, on the North West, I mean, we're, we're very keen to do and to be visibly doing more in the North West. Um, one of the things we're doing um, in collaboration with the newly established Public Policy Forum, Pivotal is their next report, is going to be launched uh, in Derry, and we're going to be sharing that with Ulster, and very visibly so. So I think we would agree with that possibility of having more conversations like this and showing what we do, but in, uh, amplifying what we do in the North West, but also making sure that people in Northern Ireland who, uh, who want to stay in Northern Ireland to study can do so, and those who want to go away have something to come back to in terms of jobs, which goes back to the research and development point. So I suspect we'd be in agreement on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. John, you're well, thank, you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, a lot of facts and figures thrown at us. It might be useful if we can put them in a paper to the committee. Uh, for the paper committee to be able to study uh, and, and give more deliberations to. Um, a number of things jump to mind. Uh, equality has almost become a buzzword now, where organisations and, and businesses and communities come in and tell us that they want to create equality in society. Little parties. Hmm? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get you to use it. We all want to succeed getting Christopher to use it where we're flat. But it has to be more than a buzzword. It has to be equality is delivered through policy and step change. Um, so in terms of I accept to a certain degree, and I'm going to come on to that in a minute, the, the university has financial constraints. But surely the uh, university can drive forward an equality agenda in terms of participation of students from a broader socio-economic range. That is currently the case. We already have a very broad socio-economic <coughs> range, um, but we are concerned that we can't meet the demand from the wider participation students in particular. Um, so that's why we're using philanthropy and our own resources to support these students and, and bring them through the system. They do need more support once they come to university because they've had um, challenges to get there, but we do try and look after them. And I can tell you that the degree outcomes are just as good as any other student. OK, well, maybe it's a broader issue then in the sense of, I don't know if you heard Christopher's contribution to the last, uh, to the OU, where Christopher said he was four out of 40 
he, he passed the, the eleven plus. Um, if I was to give this or to agree to give the student, I sat with him my gift, or they wanted to be in my gift, uh, agree that there should be a raise of fees to nine thousand pound odds per student. Um, we still have a problem further down the line, not academic selection. And when you quote me the figures from England and elsewhere in relation to participation of students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in their universities, um, I, 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 and again, I need to study your paper. I, I just can't say to myself, OK, if £9,000 is the solution to that problem, because it's further down the line. It's academic selection. It's part of it. Well, I didn't say 9000 was the solution to the problem. No, I'm not. But and I'm sorry if I, I'm not quoting you in that sense. But one of the, the, the themes that's come from your presentation is you need more funding, and one of those funding streams would be student fees. So that's the point I'm trying to put across. No, no, I don't think I said it was student, had to be mm. student fees. I think that's that's a matter for you as, as okay. executive to decide what way you go. Scotland has no student fees. Uh. England do. We have a hybrid model. All these models can work, but they need to be properly resourced, drive things forward. So I'm not advocating for a higher level of fee. I'm advocating for a discussion as to what the right funding model is for okay. Northern Ireland, which is what the people should believe is the right one. And I, and I hope that that would be led by people like yourself. OK, fair enough. Well, I can have a selection. <laughs> I could just comment there. I think um, uh, the Vice Chancellor referred to our Pathway Opportunity mm. Programme, and that's an innovation in, in um, kind of the learning and teaching space within Queens that exactly addresses that. So we're working with schools for those those pupils who have not had the benefits, perhaps, of um, you know going through the grammar school system, for example, um, to give those very students the opportunities, despite the fact that we have this system uh, within Northern Ireland around academic selection, that we can still give, with the right funding in place, those students an opportunity for a Queen's education and all the benefits that that affords, both to them as individuals and more broadly to the economy, and addresses some of that challenge you put there around diversity and equality. Um, let me put this another way. The university wants to help to create a better society, and the university wants us, and quite rightly puts a challenge to politicians and the executive around that. Uh, does the university have a view on the pros or cons of academic selection and the impact it has on our education system? Therefore, the flow on of students going into your university. Well, we want Queen's to be accessible to anyone with the right level of ability. That's how it should be. And I would go further. I think you said we needed to do something. I think we have a responsibility to do something. But we can't influence post-primary education. That's a matter for other people. But we do want to pe see people who are able coming to Queen's. That's why we're moving into contextual entry, where we will, for example, drop grades in the A-levels to allow people to access with a lower level of A-levels because they've come from a disadvantaged background. But we can't solve the whole of post-primary education. What we can flag up is the ability to, be, to um, encourage social mobility and also to encourage better FEHE collaboration so people can move from colleges into Queen's. And we are doing all that. Well, uh, it's just another question. Um, well, I, I think there, there, there's a social responsibility on students or on universities to... Uh, to certainly follow up on the research and to promote equality within education, which is you're doing, except that there is, there is, there is good programmes going on. I suppose the challenge I'm putting forward to yourselves and to others is that we need to, we need to change policy to create equality rather than tinker around the edges. But we'll maybe continue that conversation another day. The other point I was just wanted to put this quickly is, in terms of the growth deals, are you involved in the? Growth deals uh, outside of Belfast. I know you mentioned the North West, but in terms of uh, the one in around uh, Fermanagh, Craigavon, that, that area, North South West, I think is the title that's been given. Uh, so, Ulster University have taken the lead in the North West. Mm -hmm. and we're very happy to be involved, uh, if that's yeah. appropriate. And we are making sure that the Belfast Region City deal talks to the other deals. We have been um, involved through our advanced manufacturing initiative with um, the opportunities in the, in the South West. OK. Thank you. Could I just follow up? Sorry, because the point you make about the research is, I think, mm. a very important one. And while the university can't resolve what's happening in terms of academic selection, uh, researchers at Queen's University have done and have led a lot of the research on looking at different models of it. Mm. And so I think that there is a sense at Queen's that we have a... An, 
an obligation to provide the evidence-based research on which people can make decisions. So I think we are, we're not shirking our responsibility on that, even though we can't be deciders on how it would go. So uh, some of the academics who work in our education area of, of scholarship, I think, have been responsible in terms for years of trying to put forward arguments about what they think would be the appropriate models to deal with the inequalities that the Vice-Chancellor set out and to which you refer. Okay, thank you. So can I just come in, um, because the, the social charter that you have um, is something that I, I thought was a very positive initiative when it w was um, launched, um, and one of, the, one of the aspects of it was shaping public policy, so uh, as, as you've outlined, um, you know, there is a role for, for all of the, the higher education institutions to, to be for to be utilised, I suppose, for their research ability by, by public policy and any way that um, we can facilitate that and have more dialogue in that sphere, it would be very useful. Um, and obviously, John has mentioned the kind of social responsibilities. There were also aspects of the social charter in relation to um, um, education with social purpose and um, what you call equality and excellence. We've all we've touched on some of those as well. And all of that, I suppose, is about trying to address the inequalities and to improve access and participation. And so I think that the, the social charter um, and the, the kind of social mission of, of a university is a very important thing. Um, and it's something that I think we would like to see, like we have talked in the past couple of weeks about, um, you know, the kind of governance and autonomy of universities um, and the way the two kind of interact. Um, so I think that's a conversation that the committee is probably uh, looking to explore in, in more detail as well. Um, and am I correct that your corporate plan is coming to, the current one is coming to an end? Um, wh when are you beginning to develop the, the next one and, and kind of what, what is the progress in terms of the current one? Because there were area, priority areas for growth um, and how are you doing on, on in the particular areas in terms of international students and um, research income and, and those particular um, priority areas? So we're in the midst of developing a new strategic plan. <clears throat> the first step is to consult with both staff, students and of course people in Northern Ireland and key institutions. We're doing that at present. What's very clear is that the strategy will focus on what Queen's can deliver for Northern Ireland, both socially and economically. It's also clear that everyone wants to see sustainable development goals woven through the fabric mm -hmm. of everything that we do, and not simply an appendix at the end yeah. of the document saying, and by the way, our carbon footprint is going to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. We want to weave it into everything. So that goes all the way from uh, you know, clean water supply through to education for all, uh, health, growing the economy, as well as, of course, our carbon footprint. So that's to be woven through. We've seen a demand from employers um, asking for students to be more aware of social uh, uh, sustainable development goals. And so we've responded very quickly. This is just in the last, last few weeks. So next year, next year we'll have a certificate available to all students at Queen's for them to receive tuition and support as they understand what the SDGs are about. So even in advance of that new strategy, we're taking action. Um, in terms of our international students, which I think was a specific question, um, we had about 8% a few years ago. We've moved up 12% when I took up post in Queen's at the end of 2018, and I think we're now around 15%. Um, we've still got a bit of a way to go to be consistent with our peers, but we're doing well in the international recruitment market, although coronavirus is a serious risk because it stops people sitting their English language test in China, one of our main markets. If they can't sit their English language test now, they can't come in the autumn. And so there are significant risks, but I'm sure you know, you're, you're facing similar challenges. As of this morning, 3,033 international students. Mm -hmm. That's the last chance says, which is around 15. Um, and research income was one of the um, priorities as well. Um, how are we doing in terms of the, the research income of the university? So our overall research income has dropped, um, but it's not income is not the best metric. And so one of the things that we're changing is to look at the contribution rather than the actual high level of income. So you can drive forward research income, and some of it is relatively easy to achieve, but it doesn't give you any financial contribution and may not give you the right impact on the economy. So we're focusing our research um, uh, on areas of funding that will give us a high level of return. So working, for example, with research councils 
or with businesses to do things that will be impactful both for the economy and will drive the university income further, rather than the overall income, because there are significant costs, as you know, associated with research, and most research funding does not meet the full cost. In the UK, at best, you get 80 per cent of your costs covered, which is why we need a, a university to work on a portfolio funding system across tuition fees, home and international, and research. Okay. I think just to add to that, if I may, in terms of the, the strategy going forward, I think it's very clear that um, the ambition around research going forward will have much more of a focus on quality rather than quantity. So it, it links into that argument about the financial um, recovery from research, but actually it's as much as it is about the financial sustainability, it's actually about the impact of high quality research. <coughs> And could I just ask you one final question before uh, Christopher and sorry. Um, in relation to the current level of funding that comes from European sources, it's, it varies across different disciplines, but what, what is the, the kind of average? Uh, for, from EU research funding? Yeah, so for Horizon? Yeah, so uh, totally. I can't give you a breakdown specifically, but most of it will be Horizon linked. would be of the order of 10 to 12 million. And what would that be of the total? Um, that's probably about, depending on what year, of the order of 12 to 15 per cent. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for coming along. Um, I want to just go back on terms of a funding model and just to be uh, direct, what do you think our funding model should look like? Well, I think I would, I would like to see the income that we get per student at a higher level. Okay to deliver a better student experience, to allow us to support WP more, and really drive forward the numbers that we need to meet the needs of the economy. Now, that, that, that money can be made up in many ways. I'm quite happy if it all comes from government funding, as it does in Scotland. I don't have an issue with that. I'm also happy with the hybrid model, but we've got to make sure that it, that it works, and just now it, the balance isn't right. And equally, we can work with the English model too. I think with whatever model you take, as I said earlier, you've got to make sure that you prioritise widening participation. And I think from your perspective, you want to make sure that you do get value for money, if you will, mm. and make sure that we are accountable and producing high quality graduates that meet the needs of the economy. In terms of funding per student, you give me the figure, it's uh, 9,250 in England, just above 4,000 in Northern Ireland. Do you think somewhere around six would, would meet your needs? or As an overall unit you know, of resource, Six would be probably less than we get now. Okay. Um, because just now, if you look at the amount of money we get from the DEFI grant plus the student, you're probably talking in excess of seven and a half to eight thousand okay. pounds in total. Right. Okay. In England, there's there's very little government top up, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's nine two fifty for every course, and for some high value courses, you get a top up. So the overall average in England is probably of the order of ten and a half to eleven thousand unit of resource, and we are down around uh, 8,000 a day. Okay. Um, you referred to Queen's as the University of Northern Ireland, and I, I'm a Queen's graduate myself. I went to uh, the university, and the university will always have a, a friend in me. I will always support Queen's because I do believe it's one of the anchor institutions of <coughs> the city of Belfast, and if the university is doing well, the city is doing well. But I do want to talk about an issue. If it is truly the University of Northern Ireland, or for Northern Ireland, perhaps I could talk about my own experience. When I was at Queen's in my first year, um, I was physically assaulted. In my second year, I was followed home by a group of people leaving the library. Um, and in third year, uh, I had to be, along with others, escorted by the security guards in the Students' Union out of the building because I was a prominent unionist activist. While this meeting has been going on quite by accident, or quite coincidentally rather, my niece is doing her A-levels. She's projected to get three A's in her A-levels. She's got a conditional offer to do law at the university. And my sister, her mother, texted me saying, all of this stuff going on at Queen's, I should have told Leah to go to the mainland. Do you accept that there is a unionist chill factor at the university? 
we would be very concerned if there was a unionist dual factor, as you put it, uh, in Queen, or indeed if there was any dual factor towards any group. We think that we have to steer a, a, a very um, middle ground road, if you, if you will. I understand. And be very balanced, as I'm sure you would agree. Yes. And I would be... Well, I am very disappointed to hear of your personal experience and disappointed to hear about your sister's view. I can appreciate it because of the issues that have come up, but I can certainly assure you that we are not a cold house for Protestants, as some of your colleagues have put it to me, and we will work hard to make sure that we are balanced. Um, I think we can give you many examples of why we don't believe that that is an, uh, appropriate, but we can accept that for some people that's a perception, and we have to work on how we change that perception. Richard, can perhaps I think the problem, uh, to be fair, I, I think the problem is not so much the university, but the student union. Like I'm not, I'm not, I don't think there is a particular issue in terms of a lack of balance with the, with the university. Um, I think there is a particular problem with the Queen's Students' Union and the way in which that has played out in the media. Then, I mean, I'm the first person in my family to go to university. And um, now my niece, obviously, is hoping to go to university. And I, would, I, I, I encouraged her to apply to do law at Queen's. And I just hope that, um, I don't know how the university, I know the relationship between the university and the student union is semi-detached and what have you, um, but I do think it's important that a, a message is sent out loud and clear that there is a difference between the student union and the university because it is not encouraging people from the background that I come from when some of the stuff that's been planned out recently, but just the there is a generation of people who perceive Queen's to be of one tradition. And I don't believe that, I, um, you know, but I do think that it's important that there's a bit of pushback on that to try and encourage people, particularly from a working class Protestant community background like mine. Well, th thank you for what you said positively about Queen's, and I think that's very helpful. I mean, a couple of points I would make on what can be done and is being done. The university management is utterly committed in everything it does to making Queen's a place in which everybody is comfortable, as students, as staff, as members of the public, and that includes clearly the very substantial number of people from the Protestant community who still come to Queen's and are yeah. an important and precious part of it. And in terms of the ways in which we look at the research that's done, the invitations to speakers, public debate, being representative in what we do, in the work that the Vice Chancellor has referred to in your own area of the city and also in other parts of the city which would have a Protestant and unionist mm. background, we're utterly committed to that, as well as to all other people in Northern Ireland and internationally, well, being a welcome place for everyone. Uh, I think the second thing is that where there are instances of wrong behaviour, whatever the source of it, those need to be dealt with as wrong behaviour. In other words, if somebody's being intimidated or threatened, we would want to know about that so we can deal with it through the appropriate processes and would commit to that. So I think there are things that can be done. But also friends like yourself and people in the wider society who can say perhaps the perception of Queen's as a cold house is an exaggerated one, but encouraging people to get mm. involved, encouraging people to come, encouraging people to feel that their voices are valued will be the only way in partnership that we can make sure that Queen's is a place which is a warm house for absolutely everybody in and beyond Northern Ireland. And I think, to be fair to you, Richard, you took some heat uh, not so long ago when uh, Peter Robinson uh, gave an address at the university. One well, of the many reasons I'm not on social media, Christopher, is I don't want to see people saying things about me. Oh, true. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> quite but defending, defending freedom of speech is an important part of this, and I have yes, done that. Is. And the vice chancellor and the registrar are absolutely committed to this. In, in, its, in its charter and its statutes, Queen's is utterly committed to academic freedom. <laughs> to having diversity of opinion. And one of the things that we do commit to in terms of equality that John mentioned earlier, having open debate in a way where people can disagree with mm -hmm. respect is one of the crucial things a university can contribute to. And I think Queen's is doing everything it can on that uh, and will continue to do so. So I, I would want to work with you and other people to try and ensure that Queen's is as warm as it can be for everybody. Um, just, I wonder, could you give me just an update on where things are at in terms of the relationship between Queen's and Union? The theological College. I'm happy to talk to that. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we had a review of that in 2016, uh, where we thought that there were issues regarding whether or not the provision of the theological degree through union was one which we could stand over in terms of the diversity of the curriculum and uh, its alignment with the university's role as an educator. Uh, 
we felt and came to the decision that it wasn't possible to sustain the connection in terms of the relationship that we had had. We want to be on friendly terms and good terms, and I've had conversations with people there, and we will continue to do that. But the formal link is one which is you know, being changed. Uh, Union are exploring other options, as you know, with other people who might accredit their degrees, and we wish them very well with that. Our keenness is to remain friends with the neighbours, but we felt that it wasn't possible, given the nature of the provision of that degree, for us to continue uh, the long-standing connection with Union. I know that's caused some sadness for people. Um, I have met with members of the Presbyterian Church and members of the, the community, as colleagues uh, have done um, from the management team, and we want to, and we are committed to maintaining a friendly relationship, but we felt that it wasn't possible to maintain that connection in terms of the provision of that particular programme, given the way it was being done through Union. And does Queen's intend to, does Queen's intend to produce its own theology course in time? We wouldn't rule that out, but we haven't at the moment decided on where we will go with that. But what we want at the moment is to, to make sure that the students who are going through the system, to whom we made a commitment, will be taught and, and will get their degrees. Uh, we are always open to the possibility of exploring that. There is a lot of work done in Queen's in the area of theology and religion. Um, uh, there's a religious studies research forum which has involved very significant discussion by people from Queen's and elsewhere, including people from many different religious backgrounds. And so discussing religion in a in terms of serious discussion and debate and public debate is an important part of what we do. Um, but at the moment, we're not, we don't have an immediate plan to replace the programme. Okay. Thank you. Gordon. Thanks very much for your presentation. I think we were very informative. The r and funding was mentioned. Um, it obviously is an ongoing challenge. I would, you would be aware, obviously, that there was some major success in relation to that, mainly working with large manufacturers like Bombardier and so on. So do you feel there will be a, a challenge there, an ongoing challenge to meet the, the needs for future funding to fill the gaps perhaps in, in the years ahead? Well, I think it's really important that we work with business and industry. So we do have partnerships with Bombardier yeah. and we do work with other companies like Allstate, for example. I think it is important that we take forward an integrated proposal to government. What we're seeing across the UK now is clusters coming together. Not a single university or a single business bidding, but clusters around key areas. And uh, you can see that happening in Manchester, you can see it happening around Sheffield, you can see it happening investment in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And we've not got our cluster pitch, if you like, from another island no. together. And that's why I raised it specifically with this committee, because I think we've got to have government business and industry, universities and even the people in Northern Ireland joined up with a coherent ask to the Treasury for that UK level investment, that non-devolved investment into place-based funding here to support economic growth and level us up. But we can't do it as a university alone. I think we can only do it working with you and working with industry. Yeah, I think it is a major challenge. You know what, the ERDF funding obviously was part of that and uh, was, was successful as we are very much aware of. So. That in the future will be a challenge, so it's something this committee obviously will be engaged in, and we will obviously be uh, looking to yourselves for an input in relation to that. Um, could, could I just add on yeah. that? Uh, in, in terms of um, inward investment in, in the kind of research and innovation space, City Deal and the growth deals that are happening across Northern Ireland will be a key factor in that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the universities together are really driving is a joined up narrative across Northern Ireland so that from the outside in we can um, articulate and best present the strengths of Northern Ireland as a whole. So we'll all be contributing to it in different ways but um, getting, getting that outside in big picture as to what are the collective strengths across the regions in Northern Ireland mm. is really important and the growth deals and the city deals are a major driver of that. Good. Yes, the next point actually was on the city deals. You're obviously going to be a major player there in, in a number of projects. If anything further, you did touch on it earlier, but uh, we're, it's an exciting future in relation to the city days. I think we're all uh, excited about what is happening there. Have you any more of an update on that and how that will develop out? Sure. So I, I chair the Innovation Pillar Board of the Belfast Region City Deal. Right, yeah, and do. there are uh, five components in the Innovation Pillar. Um, Digital Health, led by Ulster University, uh, another health initiative led by Queen's, Creative Industries, which is jointly led between Ulster and Queen's, Advanced Manufacturing Queen's, and then the, the whole computer science digital component, which sits in with our cyber security initiative, 
but which underpins all the other areas. You know, for example, the future of medical research is largely based on mathematics and computer science now. Creative industries are more and more reliant on computer science. Advanced manufacturing certainly is. So we've integrated the whole lot using that computer science approach as an enabler as well as something that can drive research in its own right. So we're currently at quite an advanced stage. We've got um, outlined business cases for uh, three of the programmes now submitted. Two are still in development um, and we hope to move forward pretty fast ones once we get these. What they'll deliver though is capability and capacity. They don't deliver us revenue funding to make these initiatives wherever if you like. So we have to make sure that we do have a significant flow of mm -hmm. grants and contracts from government, from research funders, from industry to make these facilities work and to drive a, a positive feedback loop, if you will, that will give us further investment and further economic growth. And a discussion with this committee would be very valuable in how we sh ensure that we are lined up with government for not just the Belfast region city deal, but I think all the growth deals which have to be integrated and have to be sustainable. Okay, good. Uh, a couple of other points. Uh, there has been an ongoing industrial action by Queen's University lecturers. Uh, how has that progressed? Is any further progress made in trying to resolve that? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a national sector-wide dispute, and it's not yeah. simply for, for Queen's, so all universities are, are affected. There are five components to the dispute. The first is about pay, and that's nationally agreed um, pay, so that's done in terms of collective bargaining. The second is in pensions, where there's an issue over having defined benefits in the pension scheme, and again, that's national and subject to ongoing talks. And I would add that the university had increased its level of superannuation payment from 14%, I think, in 2014 to 21.5% of salary now. That's happened already. Um, the employee has uh, gone up to 10.5% because it's a two-thirds, one-third split. So there's been significant movement already, but there's still discussion. Just to add on that, that is significant because every 1% increase in employer contribution is a million pounds for Queen's. So it, it, that increase yeah. up to 21.5% is very significant. And then there are three other areas of dispute. The first one is in gender pay, um, which we believe is important for us to address. So when I started at Queen's in 2018, it was 14% for professorial gender pay. It's now 5.8%. We've done that in 18 months. Secondly, another issue is casualisation, where the unions are concerned about the use of casual workers. Um, that's an initiative we actually started work on before it became a dispute with UCU, because we recognise it's an important issue. But it's a muddle of things. So sometimes it's a lecturer from State King's College London who's examining a PhD here, and they get a small fee for that, and that counts as a casual worker, which clearly doesn't make sense. Yeah. But there are other people who are in very short-term contracts, but it would make sense to change it, so we're working on that. And the final part is on workload allocation. We agree it's an issue because it can be a bit lumpy across universities, and we have a working group already um, ad addressing that. I would say in all these things, we've worked very closely with the main union, with UCU. We've set up a new staff forum to address these issues. We've brought in a new appraisal system, well, personal de a professional development system rather than appraisal system, to give our staff more support. And we are looking at how we um, create a better environment overall, not just for our staff, but for our students. Okay, obviously, you have a lot of staff. How many staff do you have? 3,700, approximately. Does that include part two? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, have you a bid into the department for to help to resolve this? No, we haven't asked for a mental funding towards it, to, towards us at all. We've dealt with, dealt with this so far, at least, from our own resources. Right, OK. Have you bids into the department for for other funding? No. No, not at present. No. OK. Just the other point. Christopher made the point about you know, about being a cold house for, for unionists and students and so on. You know, obviously, 51% can at times go to GB. That can vary from 35 to 51. Is that right? I, my figures are right. It's 31 to 37%. Go Sorry? to 31 to 37%. 30, right, so young people leave Northern Ireland to go to GB. Right, so um, 
it, and that's, that's a big challenge, really, isn't it? You know, and, and will you recognise the point he's making, this thing about the cold house for unionism? Um, this has been going on for years. Now time has marched on and went through the troubles. And I think it's something that um, we, would, we would have felt by now has, should have resolved itself, but unfortunately it hasn't. Do you think more should be done to try and address that issue and also, also to try and attract more of our young people to, to come to Queen's, which is an excellent facility. It's local and, and, and it's, um, it, it, there's been great outcomes over the years. I think we all recognise that. My own two sons went to it and we would encourage more and more of our, of our families to go and be supportive of it. But there is always this factor thrown up. The very, you know, the very fact that, that more than a third of our students are, are drifting out, out of Northern Ireland uh, is surely a challenge to you. It's a big challenge and part of it is because we don't have enough places to accommodate them. Some of times it's because they go through choice and of course if people want to leave and pursue goals elsewhere we should support them so we're not against people moving but we don't want them to move because they have to move. With regards to the perception I think it's quite difficult for Queen's to shift the dial on its own. I think we need people like you helping us and advocating for us to reinforce the message that the university is not a cold house and that we are welcoming and inclusive. So again, I think it's a responsibility for all of us in society to make, for, to make the case that Queen's is inclusive and that we do offer that balanced approach that covers the needs of all aspects of the societies that we serve in Northern Ireland. OK, we appreciate your comments. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, we are getting a wee bit pushed for time, and there's, a, I think, another four members asking questions, so we can keep them brief as possible. Claire, you're <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, you talked about um, your, your wish to have more integration with government in terms of policy development. I'm just keen to understand what you feel that would look like, what would be a successful model of that. Um, I, I think it's a great um, idea. And you know, certainly, I think with any piece of policy development, we we should um, seek to have an academic perspective, and certainly have the research behind anything that we're trying to do. That said, um, I, I I don't see too much engagement, and maybe that's 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 a personal thing, around you know certain issues that are coming forward. You know, so in the assembly, sometimes we would have um, briefings where it says consider this. There's policy gaps here. You know, I would like to see more of that from you know Queens and indeed the other universities to to say, well, members, have you considered this? Or because you know, again, all members will realise that we get a raft of information all of the time. And I'm merely making a suggestion: Do you have a Northern Ireland Assembly liaison officer who could work specifically with individual members and departments to try and suggest in particular areas? Now we do have our own research department, but it's it's quite limited in some of the information we get. It doesn't have that real solid kind of academic perspective. So Yeah, so we do have a public engagement team that can liaise um, with your advisors and with you directly. Um, clearly, they don't have the solution to everything, but yeah. what they can do is give you very rapid and accurate signposting to where the expertise mm -hmm. lies in Queen's mm -hmm. or indeed in other universities. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'd like to see today as a signal that we're very much open for that type of business. Mm -hmm. We want to engage with you and help inform the policy debate. Um, whether that's on how we develop um, research investment to drive innovation or whether it's looking at the, the right funding model for higher education. We would like to be part of that and very much I would like to see it, now that you're back in business as it were, having a proper dialogue and partnership with you. I suppose what I'm trying to say, almost encourage is, is a more proactive approach. The Northern Ireland Assembly has a very specific remit broken by down by various departments, and within each department, you can almost identify the policy areas that are missing or could be improved upon, and bring that to the attention of members. Like I always make the point that politicians shouldn't be fountains of knowledge; they should, you know, they should take their advice and their information from various stakeholders, and then bring all of that together in terms of a better policy. So, you know, I, I suppose yes, you know, I, I welcome you know, your, your ask of wanting more integration but I, I would want to see what you think that looks like and then I you know I would certainly be happy to give feedback in terms of saying what I would find useful like I'm hoping to develop a private members bill and I've already engaged with um, a, a lecturer within Ulster University um, because of her work around um, uh, this area so you know I think you could certainly identify that amongst members but also the departments as well we'd be very happy to do that okay thank you John well, well firstly just uh, Christopher's back uh, 
his experiences are totally unacceptable. I think, and it's that reflection of Queen's University. It's, it's those who were responsible for uh, those activities around. Christopher and I hope the police thoroughly investigate. If culprits were detained, they were properly dealt with. Uh, in relation to that issue, um, I, I think there's a huge responsibility on commentators within the unionist community, within the nationalist republican community, to ensure that we have an informed debate about what is or isn't happening within the university. There's a huge responsibility here. Universities have to be a place of uh, dispute, a place of discourse, uh, a, a place of where differences are, are debated and discussed, and sometimes that will be in a, in, a, in a quite lively manner, but there should never be places of discrimination. And I have no doubt the, the top table would, would share that view actively involved in ensuring that doesn't happen. But we all have a responsibility to ensure that perceptions out there are, are dealt with and that we, we certainly we can do whatever we can to assist within that. But the, the, the question I wanted to return to is in terms of, of the cap in student numbers, uh, apologies because I'm new to this committee and new to some of these, these topics. The, the university is looking at the cap lifted. The greatest barrier to that cap is finance. Is that correct? Just That's correct. Okay. Ha, has the university explored fully use of its own reserves or resources to lift that cap? And if that was the case, could they make a presentation to the minister or to this committee and say, look, we can take an X amount more students based on our own reserves if you would allow us to do so? Well, you can only spend reserves once. And the well, income, let's put it that way. Uh, we, well, we do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll perhaps let Joe talk about the finances in, in more detail. Yeah. But, uh, but in terms of reserve, we only send, spend that once. And what we're asking for is a sustainable funding model that allows us to drive yeah. things forward. Joe can talk about the finance in more detail for you. Okay. So I think in terms of um, the university has um, historically been very well run, very well governed. So as a result of that, we have a very healthy balance sheet. Um, and I think sometimes the narrative points to that healthy balance sheet and says, well, actually, can't you help yourselves? But uh, as the vice chancellor said, that position around our, our reserves, which are healthy and we have very, very little debt as an institution, is because we've managed ourselves responsibly and we do invest in, uh, for example, at the moment we're investing in a £40 million new student centre um, and we're doing that from within our own resources so we're not going and, and bidding for funding for that development. Um, but where, where we talk about a sustainable funding model, we couldn't use those reserves to fund additional student places because they would very quickly deteriorate and we actually are required by legislation to invest a certain amount of our um, if you like, surplus every year into putting it back into maintaining the infrastructure um, and the, you know, the fantastic facilities we have on campus. In terms of our year-in-year year year position on our income and expenditure model, for the last full uh, academic year, um, we actually, financial year, we had a £38 million deficit. So, so um, now some of that accounts for um, some very specific one-offs like the pension scheme liabilities. But even, even um, after allowing for that, we do plough our surpluses back into investing. So actually, as far as we can, as within our gift, without eating into those reserves, which would be a non-sustainable sustainable solution, we do invest anything we make back into, whether it's student experience, significant investment in mental health that the university's made recently, the investments the Vice-Chancellor's talked about in terms of widening participation. We do that, and there's, there's a lot we do over and above some of our comparator universities from within our own resources because we are so financially well governed. Okay, okay. I'll give you another example. So we, we built two brand new sets of residences in central Belfast to start to repopulate the city centre at a cost of 72 million which fell in the university. We've put over £20 million pounds into the Belfast Region City deal. Uh -huh. We are putting money into widening participation. The issue for us is it's not sustainable. <coughs> so we do try and invest with it very wisely to drive the student experience, to drive our capacity, to make sure the fabric of our campus is really excellent. But we need that sustainable model to do this long term. And this is a long term issue for us to catch up after many years of underfunding. Can I just come in very briefly on that? Um, the, what is the current spend of the fee income on um, widening participation? Because it was reduced, obviously, by the department in what, 2015, the amount that you had to spend, but you were still, at that point, spending more. What is it currently? 
Um, I don't have the precise fingers, uh, figures uh, to hand, but we can provide those to you. But what I can tell you is we, we didn't reduce our investment in widening participation off the back of that. We mm. dis redistributed where we've, we focused our resource so that we could maintain that investment in widening participation. And actually, if anything, we've increased it recently. And when John talks about potentially using some of the, the income for the likes of widening participation programmes, are there barriers to doing that? Uh, the, the only barriers are that in, in terms of, for example, our innovative pathway programmes, we're seeing growth in demand and we're seeing that we've got a model that is really effective for allowing students from a disadvantaged background to come and have the same outcomes as a student from a more advantaged background. But the barrier is there's a limit to how, how much we can meet that growing demand. So our pathway programme, we've seen the demand really ramp up there. And whilst we're continuing to invest, we can't keep investing at an exponential rate uh, because we'd be spreading our resource too thinly. But in terms of the, the numbers of places, you have a cap on the number of places and <coughs> you can't take in any more students even if you wanted to from a widening participation background yeah. because the cap's there. Yeah. yeah. So, so there are two very distinct issues. One is funding each FTE, full-time equivalent or head of student, at an appropriate level. Um, for, in terms of us being competitive as a university, and a quality of student experience and quality of research. And then the second is the absolute number of places. Simply lifting the cap, whilst that would help in terms of us offering more places, we could only do that if each fake place was funded at an appropriate oh. level. Okay. John. Thanks, Chair. I know we're pushed for time. Thank you so much for the presentation. I think it's been very worthwhile to date. You asked one of the questions at the start, what can Queen's do for Northern Ireland? And I think it does a wonderful job as it is. You talked about 1.1 billion in terms of the fiscal impact in locally, um, the innovation that comes out of it, the R&D, you know, the game-changing things that you can come up with to help our society, whether it's medical or technology. And I think that is, it is so important. Um, you brand Queen's around the world in a fantastic way, which in effect brands Northern Ireland and it's, it's good for, for the impact here. Um, the funding model is not something we'll sort out today. Obviously, it's such a big discussion, as much as you'd probably love us to, and it is a discussion that has to be had. But um, how much of that, how much is the problem around funding re requiring um, a reliance on international students, up to 15%, and how much of an impact is that having on domestic students with the limited places? I mean, if it's not sorted, do you get to a point where you need to bring in so many international students to fill the, the gap in funding? So, first point is that international students do not displace home students. Okay. We take the absolute maximum of home students that we're allowed, and in fact, I risk it every year since I've arrived and break that cap. Um, and I'm, I'm risking it because you guys fine me. Yeah. If we if we recruit too many Northern Irish students, we get fined for educating Northern Ireland. So, <laughs> sure, we need to change that. Um, so, so we take right to the maximum that we can possibly do. Um, the international student numbers do need to grow, and they need to grow for a couple of reasons. First of all, universities are places of global learning, and Queen's is a global university. We want to attract the very best people from around the world to come and study here. Now, in our competitor universities, you're looking at 25, 30, even 35 per cent of the students are international. So our starting point of 8 per cent a year or two ago was not terribly high. 15 per cent is good, but I think we can go a lot higher. The part of that is about ensuring we've got a diverse campus. Of course, it does help because, from a funding perspective, we operate on a portfolio basis of international students paying international fees, home students, and research. Research generally makes a loss. Home students, mm, you're pretty round about break even. Here, we probably make a little bit of a loss because of the funding regime. International, you probably have a little bit of a surplus. You put it together, and you've got a university funding scheme that works. So we want to try forward our international numbers, and we've been pushing that quite hard, but it really isn't to the detriment of our home students. We think it's to the benefit of the home students, because it creates a more diverse, inclusive campus. Where do you see those international students come from? Obviously, all around the world, but are there any particular areas? China, for example, I know you're targeting yeah, there. So the China's market. probably our biggest yeah. single market. Yeah. We've got about 1,300 from Hence China. the new logo and the, the red branding and things, I suppose. Uh, well, <laughs> is that, or is that just coincidence? That was close to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think the red branding was here before we... <laughs> <laughs> but we are trying to diversify the market. So I've been spending a, a lot of effort in trying to develop the Indian market. Mm -hmm. We are also active in the Middle East. Interestingly, Queen's has got a great reputation in Jordan, um, very important university for partnership working there. 
We're also interested in Malaysia. Richard leads work in the US. An interesting figure is we attract more students from the USA than we do from England every year. So we are an international brand and we can, we can deliver. We want to diversify the markets and really diversify Belfast and Northern Ireland by the recruitment of students from across the globe. Okay. Um, just to go back to discussion, I don't think anyone in here thinks that Queen's University is a cold house for anybody, but Christopher's point is well made, as is John, that um, there is a perception among some people. Um, first of all, that, yes, it's a university should place for discourse and everything else, and it should be done in a respectful manner. And the fact that you've received shared education awards and whatnot, and I think the general perception is that Queen's University does a wonderful job in terms of promoting everybody. But there is a disconnect, I think some would believe, um, constituents of mine who are university students from the unionist background say they feel uncomfortable within certain aspects of the union. And there is a disconnect between the union, student union, and Queen's University PLC. And as much as they are slightly different, they're seen by many as one and the same. And I think you can spend all the money on PR and all the great work that you do, creating a wonderful brand, which is what it is, when you've got this one aspect of it that continually sees that problems or has a perception being thereof that does fuel a narrative that, I mean, we see it again in the recent PR around that there is a cold house. I don't want to dwell on it because I know it's been raised two or three times, but it is an issue. Can I just comment there? I mean, I think um, the student union, as you know, no differently to any other mm -hmm. student union anywhere else, is run by the students for the students. Where I do think you could support us is encouraging um, true engagement from all parts of the community in how how that operates. Um, and that, that is one of the issues that we, we struggle with, is about getting full, full engagement from all parts of the community in, in what is a very well run, you know, in the case of the latest example, a democratic process. Mm -hmm. um, but it does rely on engagement, and if you could support us in encouraging that from, from all parts of the community, that I would think we're all happy to do that. I think, sadly, experiences up to this point from some who have tried to participate in it haven't been that positive. But I appreciate it's not specifically a QUB's issue, yeah. it's, a set, it's a set one, but yeah. you'll do see it as one yeah. this game. I mean, just in terms of the statistics um, on uh, our, our staff and student population are broadly in, in line with Northern Ireland mm -hmm. census. So from a student perspective of those who declare themselves to be either Protestant or Catholic, 41.5% uh, uh, declare as Protestant, 58.5% as Catholic, and that is, that is broadly in line with the, the census. Okay, thank you very much. I do appreciate your time today. Thanks, Guy. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. And it will be brief, uh, like others. And just to follow on from that, I think it is fair to say that this isn't an issue unique to Queen's. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, even within my own constituency, we there's challenges around the, the Austrian University of McGee. And, you know, these are things that we need to address. But that can't take away, obviously, from the fantastic work that, that goes on at Queen's. And I've seen it firsthand uh, when I was on the Health Committee and I was over there seeing the, the outstanding research. And it's really something that we can all be proud of, uh, particularly in Queen's, but, but as in Northern Ireland as a whole. Uh, Professor Greer, uh, one of the things that, that I did welcome and had the opportunity to, to be at one of the events that you hosted in North West uh, is that change in relationship. Uh, it's fair to say maybe you know, two or three years ago, the relationships between yourselves and Ulster University maybe just weren't as, as, as strong or as supportive. And I, and I appreciate, since you've come on board uh, and your team, uh, that has improved. Um, one of the issues where I've seen that is, is for example, around uh, the issue of the, the Graduate Entry Medical School uh, and that conversation in the North West. Uh, has that, um, where is that relationship currently sitting? Are you still as, as supportive or as enthusiastic about that, recognising the fact that you know, you've made it very clear today that you're uh, up for all of the challenges and that you see yourself very much as a willing partner to, to support us in addressing mm -hmm. uh, some of the wider difficulties? Mm -hmm. Could you maybe elaborate on, on where the, the medical school currently sits with yourself? Yeah, I'll maybe start with the relationship between Queen's and Ulster. Um, it's really important that we don't see the competition as being on the other side of Belfast. We've got to think about how we work together as a sector <coughs> difference. So that collaboration across the sector, and I would say across sectors, plural, because I think we have to work with FE and we have to work with business and industry and indeed with the government to create that right collaboration. So that collaboration obviously has to start with the two, uni the two major physically based universities working together, and that remains true today. Obviously there's a change of leadership at UU, as, as you know, but our relationships with the um, ongoing senior leadership team at UU is very good. 
We've been working together very closely in Belfast Region City Deal. You asked specifically about the Graduate Entry Medical School, and we need, in Northern Ireland, substantially more medical graduates. Mm -hmm. Now, it's going to take 10 or 15 years before these graduates can do a, an independent job of work as a doctor. Meantime, I think we've got to work on developing the postgraduate issue to stop people leaving and keep people here because it's the right place to be for your postgraduate training. Because Queen's is the established medical school, we need to take that on, and we are, and we will. Um, we need to offer a variety of routes to, to get a medical degree in Northern Ireland. It doesn't have to just be Queen's. We recognise that. We think there is scope for a graduate entry programme. We've got no issue with that development at, at, at McGee. Our concern is that if we have more than one medical school in Northern Ireland, we can create an adverse outcome for some students if it's not coordinated and done in collaboration. Because most medical student education is not done in the university. Mm. It's done in the NHS mm -hmm. by medical uh, or clinical practitioners. Mm -hmm. So if you've got two university medical schools with different programs using the same hospital, Alton McGelvin, for example, in the North West, mm -hmm. and the clinicians who teach them will become confused. They won't know which student is from which university and because the courses don't match together. So we've worked very hard with the team at UU who are developing that medical school to make sure that the two courses will actually come together. And it would be difficult to work out whether you were a UU student or a Queen student by the time you get to third year and you're in the hospitals because they would be at very similar stages. So the groups developing the UU graduate entry scheme and the Queen's um, medical school have been working together to make sure that that is the case. We need more doctors than that graduate entry medical school can provide on its own, of course. So we'd like to see a bigger level of medical student expansion. But honestly, it's going to fall on stony ground unless we deal with the postgraduate issues, which means sorting out postgraduate medical education and training and interfacing it well with our NHS system. So we remain supportive of, of that or of anything that will deliver a better outcome for Northern Ireland. But you do see it very much as a, as a partnership? Uh, yes. You know, it's, not, it's not going to be a solo run of... It has it's to be, be otherwise we're taking a risk with Northern Ireland. And we won't produce the best doctors and we won't retain them because they'll see a disintegrated rather than integrated yeah. system. Yeah. No, thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. This is something no doubt we'll come back to uh, in the future. Thank you. That's us all now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think so we're moving on then to item number six on the agenda and it's matters arising and um, 6.2 is at page three of your, oh sorry am I missing, oh no, the, six point, yeah, sorry 6.1 to, um, we're going to write to the um, Tourism Alliance to seek their views on these issues. Had already yeah, so, um, Talbot Elster and the LA Hotels Federation, we asked for their research. That's great. On that. Okay, 6.2 then is a request from the committee for further information on McGee and student financing arrangements. It's on page three of your table packs. Um, unless members have any actions, we'll just note it for now. Yep. Um, page six of your table packs is a, a correspondence from the managing director of Sony. Um, providing an overview of its work and various issues, including the role in the energy strategy and work on behalf of the consumers. Um, there is a future briefing from, from Sony already being arranged. Yeah. Um, 6.4 then... Uh, they're, they're coming here all been well. Yeah, we're, we're trying to organise that in. They're, they're going to be part of our energy stakeholder um, forum as well. So hopefully we'll get a couple of opportunities to engage. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, 6.4, at last week's meeting members considered correspondence from the utility regulator um, regarding Sony governance. There is correspondence um, uh, from... So, Chair, what we're asking for is if we can uh, get members' approval to pass oh, that on to Mr Frew, who had flagged up the situation in the first place. Yep. Happy to do that. <laughs> Um, sorry, moving on then to... You mean the response from Sona? Yeah, no, the response from the utility right regular there. laying out um, okay, Sony exactly. review. We got that last week, and yeah. last week's back. We will get you a hard copy of that now. Um, what are you Yep. Yep. Crap. Moving on to item 7. Um, it's the SL on the Mines Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. There is a copy of the clerk's memo at page 34 and then an, the SL1 at page 35. 
Um, this statutory rule amends the mines regulations 2016 to increase protections for persons who work below ground in coal mines in relation to exp um, exposure to uh, one particular carcinogen. Um, the SR is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly and it's anticipated the rule will come to, to operation on the 30th of March 2020. Um, this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it's not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid out in the Assembly Business Office. So are members content with the policy implications of the proposed legislation? Chair, maybe just the one thing to flag up is, it is specifically for coal mines, we don't have any. Yeah. So this is effectively just in case we decide to get one. one. Not yet. At some point we do. So if members are content, we let right. them out. Right. The risk is rather low. Um, number eight then is correspondence. Um, there is a memo from the clerk of the Finance Committee on page nine of the table pack, which outlines plans to ensure a transparent budget process. This will initially take the form of research to inform the Finance Committee's deliberations. So. Um, there is a budget briefing which has been requested from the department for the 1st of April meeting. Um, so we'll just note that unless there's any further action. Okay. okay, so then 8.2 is correspondence from the Clerk of Finance at page 10 of your table papers. And some members are probably already aware of this issue in relation to business who signed up to the plasma screen advertising and then the collapse of that company. Um, so the Finance Committee is of the view that this falls under the remit of the Economy um, Committee. Um, neither committee has received any written representations from the affected businesses. Um, it's a commercial issue and there are there may be um, attendant legal issues, yeah. proceedings. The, as a result, it's not really an issue for the committee to pursue and as we haven't received any correspondence um, as yet anyway. Um, members might have concerns about the issue and the potential um, support and redress that might be available for the businesses. So we would seek your agreement to write to the department to ask if there has been any engagement with the businesses and what type of redress they they might have. Okay, then 8.3 is correspondence from an anonymous source that we I received um, the day before yesterday. It was at page 11 of your table papers and it um, highlighted some allegations in relation to support provided by Invest NI to a company which then collapsed. Um, as it was anonymous, um, and while the author seeks an audit office investigation, the committee cannot ascertain whether the author would give permission um, to forward the correspondence to the PAC or the department. Um, and at the committee is not a scheduled authority to offer whistleblower legal protections. Um, what are we doing without just noting it? So, so the course, we would seek your agreement to forward the correspondence to the audit office um, for the information of the controller and auditor general, and um, that is our standard protocol in terms of whistleblowing. Right, thank you. Um, item 9 then is our forward work programme. It's at page 40 of your pack. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, then moving on to item number 10. It's uh, any other business, and Claire has a request to, to raise some business. Okay. Um, it was in relation to the public consultation from University of Ulster in relation to the health sciences coming to Corian. Um, I suppose where I have a, a bit of an issue with this is that um, the Vice Chancellor had been in touch with me a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, to say that the Allied Health Sciences would be paused coming to Corian. At the time, I had expressed my concerns that this wouldn't be paused and indeed it would be a stop. Um, it concerns me ultimately because a number of courses were lost from Corian in the anticipation that we would receive these health sciences. We are now in a situation where this is being put out to consultation which could suggest that they may not come to Corian in the interim and I do have a concern that we have lost courses and nothing is coming to, to replace those numbers. Um, so I suppose I would make a suggestion that, and I'm not sure how appropriate it is given that it's in a consultation, but that we ask um, Ulster University to, to clarify why we are in a situation that this is now going out to consultation again when I assume that decision had been made, it had been paused a number of years ago, whereas this now feels like they have changed tack completely. Is there anything in writing? 
Um, I received um, an email as a stakeholder to say that this was out for consultation. This was on Friday, but um, I, and I think it was accompanied maybe by a press release as such. What, um, I'm, what I'm trying to clarify is, is there anything in writing in terms of please. your previous understanding? Um, what, do you mean of, in terms of, of what he of, said of, was coming to Coleraine? Um, no, probably not, because I met with him um, oh. at the time. But that, that was part of their business plan, and it was, it was about the restructuring of, of Ulster right across yes. Northern Ireland. Would you want to so I, I would bring say them in? Why don't you bring them in and ask them? We are, we are going to McGee We're up there on the 26th. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, I would imagine we'll his plans are in writing, to be fair. His original plans are in writing. Aye, that's yeah. what I yeah, mean. Yeah, no, I would imagine they are. We yeah. track that down. Yeah, yeah. We track that down. Thank you. And we write as suggested about why the consultation doesn't follow up on that, Chair. Okay. Members are in agreement. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So, moving on then to item number 11, the Renewables Obligation Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019. There is correspondence at page 13 of the table papers from the Minister advising of a technical change to the Renewable Obligation Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019 to ensure they don't have an unlawful retrospective effect due to the transition period. Um, the initial statutory in instrument enacted in the absence of the executive amended the, the NIRO legislation, as well as that for renewables obligations in Scotland, England and Wales to correct the te technical inoperabilities in all three regarding the strict sustainability requirements for bioliquid fuels used for the generation of electricity due to the UK's withdrawal from the EU. So it's for noting unless any actions are being suggested. Okay. So then item number 12 is our next meeting will be here next Wednesday at 10am. Okay. Thank you. So the meeting is adjourned.